Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! I, 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 Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello and welcome to GB News Live with me, Mark Longhurst, and coming up today, an orchestrated reality show or a heartfelt cry from the heart? We'll be reflecting on all the reaction to the Sussex show as Harry and Meghan's documentary hits the airwaves. The couple claim the royal family set out to destroy their relationship from the start and is also guilty of a huge level of unconscious bias. But so far, there's been a deafening silence in both Buckingham and Kensington palaces. The former US spy who killed teenager Harry Dunn to be sentenced in an unprecedented case at the Old Bailey. Our cameras will be in live at the court at 2 p.m. for that. Striking NHS workers could now be targeted as part of Rishi Sunak's promised tough new measures to curb the wave of industrial action. It all comes as the government struggling to deal with the wave of winter strikes. The army now on standby to move into hospitals and airports. We'll bring you the latest on this winter of discontent including the freezing weather. As we warned, snow is also on the way. First, the latest headlines with Rhiannon. Mark, thank you. Good afternoon. It's three minutes past 12. Your top stories from the GB newsroom. NHS England has announced its latest data with waiting lists for routine treatment hitting a record high and A&E performances at a record low. 7.2 million people were waiting to start routine treatment at the end of October. And in the same period, just 67% of patients were seen within four hours of being admitted to A&D. Ambulance response times have improved on previous numbers, but still sit more than 40 minutes behind the target time of 18 minutes. The government has defended its decision to open the first UK coal mine in 30 years, saying it still intends on phasing out coal. The Leveling Up Secretary has given planning permission for the new colliery in Whitehaven in Cumbria. Former COP26 President Alok Sharma has labelled the decision a backward step for UK climate action. But Michael Gove says it will create hundreds of jobs. 
The mine will directly create 532 jobs, which will make a substantial contribution to local employment opportunities, because these will be skilled and well-paid jobs. The employment and the indirect employment that would follow will result in a significant contribution to the local and regional economy, with increased spending in local shops, facilities and services. And in addition, the exportation of some of the coal to European markets would make a significant contribution to the UK balance of payments. The shadow climate secretary, Ed Miliband, meanwhile, says it's a terrible decision. Uh, opening a new coal mine marks the death knell for any claims this government has to climate leadership, and it won't provide the sustainable jobs we need. We should be going full pelt for the clean, green jobs of the future. But Rishi Sunak is so weak, being pushed around by his backbenchers, that he just can't deliver. Now, the Duke of Sussex has accused the royal family of a huge level of unconscious bias. In Harry and Meghan's new documentary series, the couple say they want to challenge misinformation around why they stood down as senior royals. The prince says he was concerned for the safety of his family and felt it was his duty to uncover what he describes as bribery within the UK media. Harry also says his wife was experiencing the same level of pressure from the press as Princess Diana had but with a race element. Members of the royal family have declined to comment on the series. The Home Secretary says protecting the UK's borders is the number one priority and has confirmed the military is set to replace striking border force workers. People wanting to travel over the Christmas period are being warned of cancellations and delays over the eight days of action from the 23rd of December to New Year's Eve. Rail workers, postal staff, nurses and paramedics are already planning to strike in the coming weeks. Suella Braverman says the contingency plans will aim to minimise disruption. Well, we have been preparing for the prospects of border force strikes for some time now. Uh, we've been analysing what the impact of a shortfall of uh, op operational personnel on our border will be. Uh, we've got plans in place that will involve, uh, to a degree, uh, bringing in some of our military colleagues to help us in a variety of roles. And we want to, I mean, ultimately, you know, I'm not willing to compromise on security at the border. That's the number one priority. To something a little lighter, the first coins with the official effigy of King Charles III will appear in circulation in post offices from today. The King's portrait will first feature on a 50 pence coin with the tail side commemorating the life and legacy of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. And the last surviving dam buster has died at the age of 101. George Leonard Johnny Johnson was one of the original members of the RAF 617 squadron. They were famous for the Dam Busters Raid of 1943, tasked with attacking German dams during the Second World War. He died peacefully at his care home in Bristol on Wednesday, surrounded by his family. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now, though, it's back to Mark with GB News Live. Rhiannon, thank you very much indeed. An orchestrated reality show. Not a viewer's comment on Harry and Meghan's Netflix show, but their own description of their engagement. Well, across a series of three programmes aired this morning, the couple have outlined their grievances from press intrusion to the royal family's high level of unconscious bias. So far, both Buckingham and Kensington Palaces have maintained a, a studied silence. But elsewhere, there's been a highly critical and even puzzled response to the claims that the couple have made. Let's uh, cross now to our royal reporter, Cameron Walker, who's been watching uh, uh, all morning from his reaction room with the, the silver screen. Uh, it's an interesting phrase, this orchestrated reality show, Cameron, because that's what they described the, uh, the whole process of their own engagement. But clearly, given what we've seen in this, uh, the first three series, they've actually premeditated a way in the, the, the phone footage clips. They've clearly been thinking about actually recording things ahead of this, uh, this Netflix uh, work. You're right, Mark. A lot of people that I've been speaking to this morning are actually questioning why there are so many supposedly private moments between the couple being aired literally 
for the world to see. But we've just, in the last couple of minutes, uh, received some kind of guidance from those who are close to the royal family. Uh, and it's understood that that claim which Netflix put at the beginning of episode one, saying members of the royal family have declined to comment on the content within this series, appears to be false. It's understood that Buckingham Palace or Kensington Palace or any member of the royal family was not directly approached by Netflix to respond to anything in that series. So from those close to members of the royal family, it looks like that claim at the beginning of the Netflix series is untrue. Well, I'm joined by former royal correspondent Michael Cole now for his reaction. Michael, your thoughts? It's very glossy. Uh, it's well made. Uh, Netflix have thrown a lot of money at it. But where's the substance? This is all sizzle and no steak. An expression I'm sure Netflix will understand. Where's the beef? Because uh, it's not living up to its billings. And if we're just going to be treated to six episodes of them blandly saying, we're wonderful and the others are horrible, we're right and they're wrong, I think that's going to pall quite quickly. Uh, of course, we've now just seen the first uh, three episodes, but it's not a good look, you know, whinging and whining. Uh, when you think about these two people in their hilltop fortress in California, lovely looking people, both of them, beautiful children, healthy, they've got all the money in the world, cars, people who want to see them, smile at them, say yes to them. What on earth have they got to worry about? Two time zones from where we're sitting here in London. There's a terrible war going on. People are being murdered, raped, and don't know where they're going to go for their food and their heat. In this country, there are people afraid to turn off the central heating because they, they don't think they can pay the bill. I just come here on the train. All those people are putting up with strikes and the eco-anarchists on the road, preventing them earning a living to pay the taxes, to pay for all this. Because if these people can't be decent to each other, if they can't be respectable to each other, why should we respect them? What do you make of their claims about media intrusion, particularly around the time that their relationship was made public? Megan talks about one of her neighbours paying for a security camera to be installed to look over into her garden. But rules have changed since the time of Princess Diana, haven't they? Yeah, there's bad behaviour everywhere. We've got to differentiate between the legitimate press and the paparazzi. That's just a bloke with a camera trying to get a lucky shot that he can sell. And Harry's misunderstands what the Royal Rotor is. The Royal Rotor is to limit the amount of intrusion so that people share the coverage that, that is done. But this is actually all nonsense. No lesser person than the late Her Majesty the Queen said to me once, 50% of my job is being seen. I have to be seen to be believed. And that is part of royalty. Harry should know that. He does know that. Certainly, uh, Meghan Markle knows that. She's in the show business business. And doesn't she do it well? A Couple of nights ago in New York, there was a bank of photographers. The whole Nikon choir was there, wasn't it? You saw it. Yeah. They were there at their invitation, of the Kennedy's invitation. If they didn't want that, there are chickens they could be uh, feeding back in, in California, looking after their children. You either want publicity or you don't want publicity, but it goes with the territory. And I said to a, a minor royal who was complaining about some unfair coverage, and I said to him, the time for you to worry, matey, is when the media is no longer interested, because that will mean the media is no, no longer interested in the, in the monarchy. And when that happens, the game is up. Let's be honest about this. Yeah. You were around at the time of the, of the wedding of Meghan and Harry. The coverage was universally positive. She was welcomed as a breath of fresh air. That was the phrase that kept going on. In Windsor Great Park, people stood 12 deep to welcome them. They couldn't have had a warmer welcome if it had been orchestrated by Cecil B. DeMille for a film. It was magnificent. So what on earth, I come to my, have they got, uh, what is the point? You know, we're in, in terms of brotherly love, 
we're not in the Jonathan and David era. We're in the Cain and Abel. Mm. Uh, part of the Bible. Well, speak, speaking of brotherly love, of course, it's the two of them, Prince William and Prince Harry, that had to walk behind their mother's coffin back in September 1997. And Prince Harry, in the Netflix documentary, talks about his experience of that, particularly his private life as a, a boy grieving his mother and him being a member of the royal family. So let's just take a listen to what he said. Paparazzi used to harass us to the point of where we had to be forced into smiling and answering questions to the travelling press pack. Right. Would you look at this camera, please? Just look at this one, I've got a yes. in it. Brilliant, you heard Travis? And that made me feel really uncomfortable from the get-go. Can you look this way? Hello. <laughs> you're right, easy. Bitches, you're right? <laughs> Hello. Do you think... Can we do something different? And then the deal was we put our skis on, and then they'd then leave us alone. Well, yeah, some of them would. But then the other ones would just then follow us around, either taking photographs or waiting for an accident to happen and then put out their cameras. So it was never fair. It never worked. Apologies there. We seem to have played the wrong clip where uh, Prince Harry there was talking about uh, media intrusion. But one of the historical media moments of Princess Diana, at least, was that panorama interview she did with the now disgraced journalist Martin Bashir. It, it, we now know that she was deceived into giving that interview. And at the time that we found that out, Prince William, the then Duke of Cambridge, said that that interview should never be played again. And yet we saw at least 15 seconds of it replayed in this Netflix documentary associated with Prince Harry. Well, you've summarised that beautifully. Uh, it was very heartfelt when Prince William went out and he said that in light of the discreditation of this interview and Bashir, that it should never ever been seen again. BBC immediately said it would not be shown again. But Netflix is not susceptible to the laws, protocols and customs or good manners of this country. It's an overseas corporation. And let's not forget this, what this is all about. It's, it's a commercial operation. It's a money-making operation. This feud is being monetized for, for commercial reasons. We can't get away from it. I think you mentioned beforehand the death of dear Princess Diana of Wales. Yeah. I was in the Abbey that day and uh, I've never known an atmosphere like it. It was charged emotionally charged, and uh, 25 years later and more, uh, she's still very much missed by me and I'm sure other uh, people who'll be on yes. your program and have been on your program. She would be devastated to think that her sons were at war, at daggers drawn like this. Um, devastated, because she always believed that they would be there for each other. And whatever happened, they would cover each other's backs. And certainly, no two brothers could have been closer. Uh, than they were. So I return to my point, what's this all about? Essentially, what we've heard so far, okay, a little bit of unpleasantness here and there, but essentially it's trivial. Yeah. Well, Michael, we've got three more episodes to go. You'll be talking to us a little bit later on, but for the <laughs> moment, thank you. Uh, Mark, I'm here in the Royal Reaction Room all day with a number of royal commentators and experts, so make sure you keep tuning in. Indeed. And, and just to reiterate the news line that's developing from this, Cameron, and that is that both Buckingham Palace and Kensington Palace saying uh, no member of the royal family or indeed uh, the official spokesman uh, approached for comment, despite what Netflix have said at the beginning uh, of these series. Yes, that's what it appears, Mark. At the beginning of episode one, there was an on-screen disclaimer by Netflix saying that members of the royal family were approached to comment on this series involving Harry and Meghan on Netflix. But in the last, well, five, ten minutes or so, uh, we now know it's understood that uh, as far as Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace are concerned, there was no approach, direct approach from Netflix or um, a pro an approach to a member of the royal family to comment on any of this content in the series. So unfortunately, we're in a situation now, Mark, where it's the royal household's word against Netflix and the Harry and Meghan PR machine. Indeed. Uh, we'll see who comes um, uh, victorious, if that's the right word from that. Uh, but we'll see what the reaction is, as we say, return to you throughout the afternoon. Cameron, for the moment, thank you very much indeed.
Let's update you now on the other news with the UK border staff to strike over Christmas at airports across the UK in their dispute over pay and conditions. Now, the PCS union has announced that uh, passport checks at Gatwick, Heathrow, Manchester, Birmingham, Cardiff and Glasgow will all be among those disrupted by the strikes between the 23rd and 26th of December and then the 28th to 31st of December before New Year. The Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, was asked earlier whether the army could be brought in to help. When it comes to the strikes or the planned strikes that have just been announced by Border Force, um, I'm very disappointed, frankly. Uh, it is uh, very regrettable that they have made this decision to uh, potentially strike over critical times uh, in the run-up and uh, following Christmas and the New Year. Um, that's, you know, if they go ahead with those strikes, uh, there will be undeniable serious uh, disruption caused to many thousands of people who have holiday plans. And um, I really want to urge um, people who have got plans to travel abroad um, to think carefully uh, about their plans because they may well be impacted. Are you going to lean on the army? Well, we have been preparing for the prospects of border force strikes for some time now. Uh, we've been analysing what the impact of a shortfall of uh, op operational personnel on our border will be. Uh, we've got plans in place that will involve, uh, to a degree, uh, bringing in some of our military colleagues to help us in a variety of roles. And we want to, I mean, ultimately, you know, I'm not willing to compromise on security at the border. That's the number one priority. So, uh, you know, that may well have another, an adverse impact on, you know, convenience for people, frankly, whether it's the time that they may have to wait um, for flights or, uh, you know, uh, departures. Uh, they may well be delayed in, on arrivals and various travel plans. Um, uh, ultimately, security at the border is my number one uh, non-negotiable priority. The Christmas cheer continues. Coming up here on GB News Live, we'll be heading to Matt Hancock's constituency. It's West Suffolk, not the jungle. After his announcement that he will not stand as an MP at the next general election to see what people there think about that decision. But let's take a short break now. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory. 
twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently, and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee. But we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. And welcome back to GB News Live. Let's uh, update you with some breaking news we're getting. It's uh, yet more news about strike action. We're being told that junior doctors in Scotland are now to uh, actually ballot on strike action uh, for the first uh, three months of next year, the spring uh, of 2023. That's according to the BMA, uh, British Medical Association. They basically say uh, the pay award they've been... Um, uh, actually told about is unacceptable, substantially below inflation, they say, and failing to address more than a decade of real-term pay cuts. The BMA saying that junior doctors in Scotland have effectively had a, a real-term pay cut of 23.5%. So they say with inflation continuing rise, the offer of 4.5% increase being outstripped, they say, and uh, their position will be worse by the end of the year. So now in a formal dispute with the Scottish government uh, and they will be balloting for that strike action uh, in the spring of or uh, from Christmas onwards and, and New Year onwards, uh, the start of 2023. Yet more uh, strike action on the way, it seems. We'll update you and get more reaction uh, from north of the border. Now, let's uh, actually update you on Matt Hancock. Uh, it's not so much of a I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, but I'm a, an MP, get me out of here, because the former health secretary says he won't be standing as uh, a Conservative MP in the next general election. He made that announcement uh, as local party members reportedly said he was not fit to represent them. It's been a huge privilege to serve in Parliament and to serve the people of West Suffolk, and I'm incredibly grateful to everybody who supported me both in Suffolk and in government since then. I've increasingly come to the view that it's so important to engage with people about politics, about how our country is run, not just through Parliament, but also through new and innovative ways. And I look forward to doing more of that. Well, that was Matt Hancock announcing that decision on TikTok. Let's get more with our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, who's in Newmarket in West Suffolk, Matt Hancock's constituency. And a, a question, of course, first of all, Darren, as to whether the, the party uh, apparatus and, and constituents had been told about this before you went on TikTok and released it on social media. Well, of course, he's not been a Conservative MP really since he went into the jungle. He's been sitting as an independent. And it seems at the moment, Mark, that is his plan for the rest of this parliament. He's not going to uh, seek the restoration of the Conservative uh, whip. So he will remain as the MP for Newmarket to the next election, which could be two years away. But he will sit as an independent. Now, it's fair to say, I don't think there's many of his constituents who seem to be uh, crying into the coffee this morning at this announcement uh, yesterday that he is not going to seek uh, re-election. A lot of them are pretty angry about his appearance on I'm a Celebrity, get me out of here. Uh, his inability, effectively, to work as a full-time MP uh, while he was in the Australian jungle. Uh, lots of them uh, seem quite pleased, at least today, uh, to be getting rid of their MP, a bit, as I say, somewhat into the future. Now, this all comes, though, only a couple of days ago when he and his spokespeople were suggesting he was going to try and get the Conservative whip back and also fight this seat. However, it does seem that he left before he was pushed because there was a meeting here in Newmarket at the end of November in which the party members here decided, as you say, to conclude that they did not have confidence in Matt Hancock, that he was not fit to be their MP, and so he probably faced uh, deselection. So it does seem that he uh, quit before he was pushed. The big question is, what does he do uh, next? Now, we're promised that he's not going to appear on any more reality TV programmes between now and the general election, so no strictly come dancing for Matt Hancock. Uh, but is the life after politics 
still in politics, i.e. when you're not an MP, being rumours that he might try to become the Mayor of London. I think in the end, irrespective of what he does decide to do, Mark, given Matt Hancock's ego, I think it's unlikely that this is the last we've heard of him in some form of public life. And how do the constituents there feel about him drawing his parliamentary salary when they voted him in as a Tory MP? Indeed, well, we heard the word weasel mentioned uh, this morning. They say a lot of people not terribly happy about all of this. It, you know, not just as he's been drawn his parliamentary salary, he's also got a book out, which has been heavily publicised, and he was paid £400,000 to appear on the ITV uh, programme. He's clearly financially done quite well in, in recent months, though he would argue he was not in it for the money, but to raise other issues, and he has donated some of the money to a local uh, charity. But yes, I, I think there is undoubtedly an element of anger here, and as I say, there's not many people going to be terribly upset that he's not going to stand at, at the next election. The question, of course, is what impact does this have on wider politics? Because it does come at a time in which we've seen uh, more than a dozen MPs now sit as independents in the Commons for one reason or another. Uh, often through scandal, including two only in the last uh, 24 hours, one Conservative, one Labour. It does not do much to enhance uh, politics and its place in public life. Darren, thank you very much indeed for updating us there in his constituency in Newmarket. Well, coming up here on GB News Live, we'll update you on the weather and the various alerts. We're being told the Scotland situation is that a number of schools now in Aberdeenshire have had to close because of uh, the snow that's falling there. And the Met Office warning an increasing risk of snow elsewhere, even far south as the south of England, as the week progresses. All that coming up. First, news headlines with Rihanna. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon. It's 12.31, your top stories from the GB newsroom. NHS England has announced its latest data with waiting lists for routine treatment hitting a record high and A&D performances at a record low. 7.2 million people were waiting to start routine treatment at the end of October and in the same period just 67% of patients were seen within four hours of being admitted to A&D. Meanwhile, the British Medical Association Scotland has announced in the last few minutes that junior doctors will be balloted for strike action after pay negotiations failed. The government has defended its decision to open the first UK coal mine in 30 years, saying it still intends on phasing out coal. The levelling up secretary has given planning permission for the new colliery in Whitehaven and Cumbria. Former COP26 president Alex Sharma has labelled the decision a backward step for UK climate action. The royal family has been accused of huge levels of unconscious bias by the Duke of Sussex. In Harry and Meghan's new documentary series, the couple say they want to challenge misinformation surrounding their decision to stand down as senior royals. The prince claims he was concerned for the safety of his family and felt it was his duty to uncover what he describes as bribery within the UK media. The royal family hasn't yet been approached for comment. The Shadow Chancellor has told industry chiefs that Labour is back in business. At a party conference, Rachel Reeves has unveiled plans to make the UK the high-growth start-up hub of the world. She told 350 business leaders in Canary Wharf the government and businesses need to work together for economic growth. Britain can achieve so much in innovation, in trade and in growth. We have the ability but we need government and business working together to make the most of that great potential, to spread opportunity far and wide right across the country, and to allow everyone with the talent, the effort and the ideas to see their vision through to reality. And the last surviving dam buster has died at the age of 101. George Leonard Johnny Johnson was one of the original members of the RAF 617 Squadron. They were famous for the dam buster's raid of 1943, tasked with attacking German dams during the Second World War. He died peacefully at his care home in Bristol on Wednesday, surrounded by his family. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Mark will be back in just a moment. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, 
television and online. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it! Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Now, the levelling up secretary, uh, Michael Gove, is facing an angry response from environmentalists after approving planning permission for that new coal mine in Cumbria. Although it's claimed the new mine will be used for steel production rather than power with uh, producing coking coal, the environmental organisation Friends of the Earth argues that decision will damage the fight against climate change. We can cross now to Whitehaven and speak to our national reporter, Ellie Costello, who's there. Uh, and Ellie, we should point out, obviously, there's a positive reaction from the local community because it means jobs. But a lot in the industry are scratching their heads at this because uh, certainly the steel producers, British Steel and, and Tata, say they won't be buying this particular coal. Absolutely, Mark. This has been a debate here for the past eight years, and it really is a controversial one. Where I'm stood now is the site of the old Hague pit. Now, this was closed down in the 80s, but it still stands today and just shows how important mining was and still is to this community. On this site, for the past 800 years, mining has taken place. And we now know that a new coal mine has been granted planning permission just a mile over that hill behind my shoulders. So there is lots of support from the local mining communities uh, that are here, but this is a very controversial issue. It's already been pushed back three times. It's been debated for eight years, but last night we got that 419-page deci decision from the independent planning inspector who granted permission with the approval of Michael Gove, the Secretary of State, for levelling up for a new coal mine to be built in Whitehaven. Now, where I'm stood now, Mark, I can actually see the, the tip of Scotland 
We are really in the heart of the Red Wall in the north of England here. Many people here voting Tory for the first time in 2019. And speaking to people here this morning, they say to me that this is the first signs they've seen of levelling up in action, investment in the north of England. They are very happy about this news. Earlier, I spoke to David Moore, who's the deputy mayor of Copeland, where we are now. I spoke to him and asked his reaction to this news. Absolutely delighted. The community's in celebration mode today. They've been waiting for this news for eight years. So we're absolutely delighted to hear now that that's been approved. Mining's in the DNA of the people here. I mean, coal's been mined here for 700 years. It only stopped in the 80s. There's a lot of people, over, you know, looking forward to getting back into that work. Um, it's going to create 500 local jobs probably another 1,500 in the supply chain. And, and the great thing with those jobs, you know, it's diversification from what we've already got here. So, we're, you know, the community's fully behind this project, and always has been. So there is a huge positive reaction in this community, Mark, especially because Whitehaven has much higher levels of unemployment compared to other areas of the country. They're very pleased about the jobs it will offer. But others that I've been speaking to are absolutely appalled with this decision. They say it feels like we're going back to the 80s. We're not headed in the right direction. And they told me this morning they feel like we're hypocrites, the UK, on the world stage because we preach about a green agenda and then give planning permission for a new coal mine. Well, earlier I spoke to Carol Wood, who's from the South Lakes Action on Climate Change group. They've been one of the most vocal groups against this coal mine, and she gave me her reaction to this news. Appointed, uh, South Lakes Action on Climate Change worked really hard on this um, public inquiry, and we were able to get a lot of support from a lot of people to you know, to participate in the public inquiry. We're pleased it got to that stage. But this is a completely backward step for UK climate action and, in fact, global action. And, Ellie, we can see the old winding wheel there behind you in the building. It looks almost like a museum. Um, how soon could it be before it's actually in production and they can get the coal out of the ground? Well, yes, it is actually a museum, Mark, and it is an area that people would come and visit, a very uh, tourist-friendly area. It is not actually clear when production could start. It would hope it could be in the next few weeks and months, but ministers are preparing uh, for a legal challenge on this decision, which could delay this a lot longer. And speaking uh, to the climate change groups this morning, they were all considering uh, legal action. They were consulting with lawyers so we could hear about uh, those legal challenges in the next few days which would put a delay on this decision. The developer West Cumbria Mining hasn't actually spoken to the press at all today. They have decided to keep quiet perhaps because they are aware uh, that these judicial challenges or legal challenges could be coming down the road but they have said that they they are going to try and deliver the world's first net zero Mine. They plan to offset any emissions from the construction, mining and domestic transport phases of this operation. And that is the response they give to environmental groups. And they also make the point that this has been mooted for eight years and it is an independent uh, commissioner who went into this report, 419 pages, and they say all of these arguments have already been put to an environmental at an independent panel and they have come back with the decision that a new coal mine should be built on this land. So they say this is the straightforward answer. Ellie in Whitehaven, thanks very much indeed for updating us with the situation there. Thank you. And of course, we'll uh, bring you more reaction to that, uh, particularly as we say, uh, perhaps with the uh, various uh, appeals to come on that decision. Now, temperatures set to drop below freezing this week, minus 10 perhaps overnight. Uh, we're being told that the snow already falling in uh, Scotland. Aberdeenshire saying it's had to close schools this morning. Uh, and we've got three million low-income households struggling to heat their homes, according to uh, the agencies. Well, the UK Health and Security Agency is issuing this cold weather alert to recommend vulnerable people wear extra layers to protect themselves uh, from the cold. Charities, too, stepping up to help people struggling. Uh, well, we can speak now to our news reporter, Rosie Wright, who's at Bow uh, in East London. And, Rosie, as I was saying, the warning that the, the snow could be heading south as well. 
It very well could be. I'd like to sort of welcome you in to the headquarters of the Wrap Up London campaign. There's some volunteers here uh, making sure that the bags are ready for when charity workers arrive later to pick them up. And they're all stuffed full, sorted, cleaned with items like this. A little gilet here which just says six to 12 months, donated by someone probably on the London Underground Network or getting a train to give it to this campaign to say what we're going to do is make sure that church groups or organisations shelters, food banks can say, we need coats, and these are known as the coat people, provide them. One of the volunteers here today is Neil. Hello. Just talk me through what you've been doing today. Uh, so we came in this morning, uh, we were given a pile of coats, we were sifting through them for sizing, uh, making sure that the zips were working, that they were clean, uh, and that they're going to go to someone who's going to appreciate them and uh, hopefully stay, stay warm this winter. So. And what you've found in some of the coats that have been donated are a few little notes and messages. Yeah, it's really lovely. It's, it's really sweet. I think they're mainly from, from kids. Um, some of the messages, I think, are meant to be there. Uh, they're really heartwarming, and some of them, I think, are just messages that they've left in their own coats. Uh, and we've left them in the coats that they've come in where we can. They're really nice. So there's a combination of things just left in pockets and things very much deliberately there for people to use. Neil, yes. thank you very much. Thank Part you. of the team of volunteers who've come in today. We're expecting about 5,000 items to leave this, I guess, makeshift warehouse, that's what we call it, uh, to go to charity organisations. John really is the man in charge, or chief coat person, I could say. <laughs> yeah. Just tell me what type of organisation comes to you and says, look, we need warm clothes. Um, it's almost any organisation. It is key workers that maybe work for some very small charities right up to the likes of Crisis for Christmas and everything in between. So the smallest organisations, perhaps for a church night shelter, maybe supporting six or eight men, um, right up to the big large national organisations operating in the city that maybe want hundreds or thousands of coats. And sometimes you're given very specific, um, what's the right word, a kind of an order list really of saying, you know, we've got children of this age and this gender, do you have yeah. coats for them? Yes, we do. And that's the bit that I think many of our volunteers like the most is making these orders up. And it's also really very, very grounded. Uh, most of the charities that we support have a comparatively small amount of coats, maybe 100 or 150, sometimes less. And because it's a small quantity, they have specific us so they might ask for something for a two-year-old boy or a three-year-old girl or a seven-year-old boy or, or, or a young woman in her late teens and that makes it really really quite human that actually you think you're 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 sorting something out and and putting it together for a person um, so the volunteers here never really feel that they're doing something in bulk it's not sort of a factory exercise it is actually going towards people um, and the comment about the cards just reinforces that. It really is a case in some, sometimes of hand-picking items that you know are going to be donated. Yeah. John, thank you very much. Um, they very kindly let us sort of interfere and just, well, observe what's happening over the course of the afternoon as uh, many of these bags we've picked up, they'll be taken down in a lift. They've got this storage space. It's absolutely vast, sort of different rooms full of bags which have clothes that will go to someone who really desperately need them. Yeah, it looks really well organised there, Rosie. And, and just to update people, how would they go about accessing the help that, that's there? I mean, is there a, a, a centre they can go to to pick a coat out? So what they're really doing here is processing coats that have been donated and the donations would start again sometime next year. But the best thing to do would be check out the campaign, wrap out London, go online, you'll find all the information there. Excellent. Rosie, thank you very much indeed. Uh, direct help to keep people warm as the temperatures plummet. Thank you for that. Uh, well, from East London to South Yorkshire now, where we've got a major incident declared in Sheffield after around 2,000 homes in the suburb of Stannington were left without gas as the temperatures started to plummet. More than 100 engineers are trying to fix a, a burst gas pipe damaged by a water main uh, on Friday. Let's speak to our news reporter, Jack Carson, who's there for us. Jack, how have they been getting on there? Because uh, clearly five days without heat, especially for the old and vulnerable, is, is uh, really a dangerous situation. You're right. That's, that's right, Mike. It is. And it, this all this incident all occurred uh, Friday evening, Saturday morning, when residents started noticing that their boilers weren't, walk, weren't, wor weren't working. And actually, some people water gushing out areas that gas usually comes, such as ovens, cookers. So that then, therefore, a, a major incident was declared here by Sheffield Council. There's over 100 engineers from Cadent here, as well as Yorkshire Water. I've been to the operations centre just a few minutes up the road, and we've got a mobile operations centre from Yorkshire Water. They've been pumping water 
day and night. Over 600,000 litres of water has currently been pumped um, already out of these pipes. People are starting to come back onto gas now, although Cadden saying that do not turn your gas on by yourself. They'll send engineers round in order to make sure it's safe for, the, for your property to have its gas back turned on. So uh, the reasons for this, of course, uh, people blaming Yorkshire Water, saying that the maintenance of the pipes hasn't been good enough, questioning with the 200, over £200 million profit that they should be doing more to maintain these pipes. Their response so far has been that this, the last time there was a serious problem here was a decade ago. And while they've been monitor, monitoring the pipe, there's been no real issue for them to take any sort of action in, 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 the, in the kind of coming last few weeks as to why this might be a problem but of course with this weather with this cold snap temperatures plummeting the typography here we've got huge long hills that these pipes run through and it's and i think simple fact that yorkshire was saying that it's just a severe backup of, of water not being able to get through the pipes and, and that bursting and the trouble with with the gas is that the gas pipes are so often laid over the top of water pipes that when a water pipe does burst it's almost a, a domino effect that the gas is also affected but what, what's then being done for all those people? And I gather it's thousands without heat or, or ability to cook. I mean, have they had shelters provided for them and, and help for food and so on? Yes, so initially 2,000 people were initially affected. We now believe that it's just under 1,000 people uh, left. And it's actually been a community coming together. There's been a local pub that's providing food and water. There's been food and water uh, trucks as well. Uh, the Red Cross have been around delivering electric blankets and, and other blankets and other, other supplies to elderly people. And it's speaking to some residents today on the street, people just coming together and actually checking in on their neighbours, making sure that they're OK, making sure that if they've got any spare blankets, they give them to them but a lot of people here having to live in their living rooms because that's the only place that they have one kind of heater um, and uh, people just kind of having to struggle and, and get on with it hopefully with people's gas now being turned back on uh, Sheffield Council saying it looks like it's going to be the end of the week when this incident is finally resolved. OK, we'll let you get back in the warm. We can see how cold it is there. Thanks very much uh, for updating us, Jack. And, uh, of course, uh, all those people still queuing for help out there. Thank you. Now, let's return to uh, Harry and Meghan and their docu-series being released this morning. Uh, the royal family have been bracing themselves for what uh, was going to be revealed, but uh, we are now learning uh, that actually Buckingham and Kensington Palace are saying they had not been approached by Netflix uh, for comment on uh, this program or series of programs, despite Netflix asserting that. Well, the series so far talking about Prince Harry's struggle with the press, his love life with Meghan and his late mother, Princess Diana. Uh, let's take a look at how uh, people have been reacting to what they've seen across the country. They should get on with their lives, be happy, and they should have, you know, make, be at peace with people because nobody's done anything so terrible to them. Shouldn't let him in the country. Shouldn't let him back in the country, sorry. You know, they're allowed to do as they please and as they want. So I think from that point of view, then, you know, go for it. It's all in the past now. They should look into the future. Oh, they keep going. They say they don't want publicity, but they end up going out there and getting it. So, no, I'm afraid I've got no time for Harry and Meghan. Well, let's head back to our Royal Correspondent, Cameron Walker, who's in the GB News Royal Reaction Room, uh, digesting uh, all the uh, uh, various revelations in the docu-series that have dropped this morning. But interesting, Cameron, that the, the story actually has developed outside the docu-series itself, uh, with both Buckingham Palace and Kensington Palace now saying that neither any member of the royal family nor indeed any uh, of the palaces approached for comment ahead of this uh, series, despite that being stated at the beginning of, of uh, the Netflix programme. Yeah, it seems to be a game of he said, she said, doesn't it, Mark? Um, I think from, we saw at the start of episode one, that there was a disclaimer by Netflix and the producers of this documentary saying that Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace and members of the royal family were approached to comment on this series, but they declined to comment. Well, from my understanding, Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace and members of the royal family were not approached for comments. Now, I'm joined by Dickie Arbiter, who is a former palace spokesperson himself. Um, Dickie, two very different um, points of view here. What's going on? What's going on is that um, Netflix have lied. Quite frankly, uh, they might well have approached Buckingham Palace, but the palace would never 
ever comment on any documentary. They never have done, and they're not going to start doing it now. Would you think perhaps it was kind of assumes that they wouldn't comment and therefore they wouldn't bother? Or whatever Netflix's motive, motor, modus operandi is in putting up that that Buckingham Palace. Uh, were approached and, and, and didn't comment uh, is something that should be put to Netflix. Buckingham Palace might well have been approached and they would have got short shrift. Sure. Well, of course, Netflix isn't here to defend itself, so we can only take what they say. There's two sides to every story. Um, but this morning, there's been a lot of talks about the fact that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex should have their titles being uh, to be removed because they are talking so publicly about their grievances with the press and perhaps the royal family later on in the episodes we'll see next week. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the only people that can remove that is Parliament. Uh, and Parliament must decide and Parliament's got a lot on its plate at the moment. We've got, uh, so we've got strikes, we've got a bad economy, we've, we've got a c broken country and they've got to deal with that and the idea of removing titles is probably so far away from their thoughts at the moment that we're going to be stuck with it. But the thing is, whatever you do, if you remove a title like that eventually, what have you got? You've got Prince Henry of Wales, which is his real title and his wife becomes Princess Henry of Wales. Mm. Um, do we want an American princess? So by removing the Duchess, you're getting a princess? You're getting a princess. Right, well... And to... it, wouldn't, it wouldn't... I mean, Diana was called Princess Diana in the popular media. Uh, she wasn't the princess in her own right, but her, she was the Princess of Wales. Remove the, the dukedom from the Sussexes and you get uh, Princess Henry of Wales or Prince Harry of Wales or Princess Meghan. We'll Take your pick. Wait. Yeah, well, we'll have to wait and see, Dickie. Thank you so much for joining me here uh, on GB News. Mark, I'm here all afternoon in the GB News Royal Reaction Room, so stay tuned uh, for all the latest analysis. Yes, indeed. Back to you a little later, Cameron. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. But now let's uh, update you on the American woman who killed the motorcyclist Harry Dunn in a road accident. To be sentenced this afternoon, Anne Sekoulis, the wife of a CIA operative working in the UK, pleaded guilty back in October to causing the 19-year-old's death by careless driving. Let's speak now to legal commentator Joshua Rosenberg uh, joining us. Joshua, thank you uh, for joining us on GB News. This is interesting uh, in the respect that we've got her giving... Uh, the evidence, of course, from America and the sentencing, we understand over video link as well. And the cameras will be in the court to see the judge's comments. Exactly. We've got two changes in the law here. First of all, the ability of a defendant in criminal proceedings to attend a hearing remotely. I don't think there's been a case where anybody has attended the entire series of hearings without ever coming to court in London before. One or two judges said there have been cases that have been done like this, but I don't know of any. So that's one thing. And the other fairly new thing, it was uh, first introduced in the summer, is that we are allowed to broadcast the judges' sentencing remarks. Now, that's the only part of the hearing that will be shown on television. You will see Mrs. Justice Chima Grubb uh, addressing Anne Sekoulis. You won't see Anne Sekoulis. And the judge will explain the sentence that she is to pass for the offence of causing death by careless driving uh, and the reasons for it. And that will be broadcast. And what happens then? Because the, the question is, of course, about jurisdiction. She's still in the States. We understand that she was actually uh, advised by her employers, the US government, not to attend for the sentencing. Um, if there is, for instance, a custodial sentence, what happens then? It can't be enforced. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, if you're outside the jurisdiction of the courts of England and Wales, if you're outside the United Kingdom, it's not possible to enforce any sentence. Now, I think everybody accepts that a community sentence is more likely. And what Anne Sekoulis's lawyer told me last year was that if there was unpaid work in the community, whatever the sentence might amount to, it's something that Anne Sekoulis would try to do in the United States. Uh, arrangements could be made. Now, this wouldn't be literally complying with the court order, but it would be Anne Sekoulis doing the best she can to do what the judge wants her to do. Joshua, thank you for that. And we'll see what, uh, literally see what happens in the court a little later. Our cameras will be there too. Thank you very much indeed. We'll stay with us here on GB News Live uh, with, uh, indeed, that uh, sentencing coming up. Our cameras in court will have it for you live. But uh, let's take a short break now.
Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeves & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Welcome back. Good afternoon. It's one minute past one. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. NHS England has announced its latest data with waiting lists for routine treatment hitting a record high and A&D performances at a record low. 7.2 million people were waiting to start routine treatment at the end of October and in the same period just 67% of patients were seen within four hours of being admitted to A&D. Ambulance response times have improved on previous numbers but still sit more than 40 minutes behind the target time of 18 minutes. The government has defended its decision to open the first UK coal mine in 30 years, saying it still intends on phasing out coal. The levelling up secretary has given planning permission for the new colliery in Whitehaven in Cumbria. Former COP26 president Alex Sharma has labelled the decision a backward step for UK climate action. But Michael Gove says it will create hundreds of jobs. The mine will directly create 532 jobs, which will make a substantial contribution to local employment opportunities, because these will be skilled and well-paid jobs. The employment and the indirect employment that would follow will result in a significant contribution to the local and regional economy, with increased spending in local shops, facilities and services. And in addition, the exportation of some of the coal to European markets would make a significant contribution to the UK balance of payments. Now, the Duke of Sussex has accused the royal family of a huge level of unconscious bias. 
In Harry and Meghan's new documentary series, the couple say they want to challenge misinformation surrounding their decision to stand down as senior royals. The prince says he was concerned for the safety of his family and felt it was his duty to uncover what he describes as bribery within the UK media. Harry also says his wife was experiencing the same level of pressure from the press as Princess Diana had, but with a race element. The royal family hasn't yet been approached for comment. In this family, sometimes, you know, you're part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And there is a huge level of unconscious bias. The thing with unconscious bias is it's actually no one's fault. But once it's been pointed out or identified within yourself, you then need to make it right. It's education, it's awareness, and it's a constant it's, it's a constant working work in progress for everybody, including me, you know? And we'll be bringing you more on that docu-series throughout the day here on GB News. The Home Secretary says protecting the UK's borders is the number one priority and has confirmed the military is set to replace striking border force workers. People hoping to travel over the Christmas period are being warned of cancellations and delays over the eight days of action from the 23rd of December to New Year's Eve. Rail workers, postal staff, nurses and paramedics are already planning to strike in the coming weeks. Sweda Braverman says the contingency plans will aim to minimise disruption. Well, we have been preparing for the prospects of border force strikes for some time now. Uh, we've been analysing what the impact of a shortfall of uh, op operational personnel on our border will be. Uh, we've got plans in place that will involve, uh, to a degree, uh, bringing in some of our military colleagues to help us in a variety of roles. And we want to, I mean, ultimately, you know, I'm not willing to compromise on security at the border. That's the number one priority. Meanwhile, the British Medical Association has announced it will ballot junior doctors in Scotland for strike action over pay. The BMA claims in the past 14 years its members have faced a real terms pay cut of 23.5%. It says with inflation rising, that will only get worse. The action would take place at the start of next year. The Shadow Chancellor has told industry chiefs that Labour is back in business at a party conference. Rachel Reeves has unveiled plans to make the UK the high-growth startup hub of the world. In front of a few hundred business leaders in London's Canary Wharf, she spoke of Labour's plans for economic growth. Britain can achieve so much in innovation, in trade and in growth. We have the ability but we need government and business working together to make the most of that great potential, to spread opportunity far and wide right across the country, and to allow everyone with the talent, the effort and the ideas to see their vision through to reality. And the last surviving dam buster has died at the age of 101. George Leonard Johnny Johnson was one of the original members of the RAF 617 Squadron. They were famous for the Dam Busters Raid of 1943, tasked with attacking German dams during the Second World War. He died peacefully at his care home in Bristol on Wednesday, surrounded by his family. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. It's back to Mark with GB News Live. Rihanna, thank you very much indeed. So, is it a Royal Rumble? As Harry and Meghan's Netflix docuseries finally airs, rather, well, Buckingham Palace says that no one has been approached for comment on the programmes, despite an assertion by Netflix in this first episode that they had declined to comment. Uh, latest on that coming up. Also, it's cold, very cold, and it's going to get even colder. A major incident declared in Sheffield. Thousands of homeowners there still without gas to heat or eat after five days. We'll be there live with the latest and how people are getting on. And some good news for England fans ahead of the World Cup clash with France. Raheem Sterling is heading back to Qatar. After that burglary at his home, we'll have the latest live from Doha. But first, the row that's already broken out over Harry and Meghan's new docu-series. Despite an assertion by Netflix in the first episode that Buckingham Palace had declined to comment, uh, the palace is saying no approach should be made to them or any member of the royal family. 
Let's get the latest with our royal correspondent, Cameron Walker, who's in the GB News Royal Reaction Room, uh, who's been watching. Um, just to update people, uh, Cameron, the King has been uh, at an event, an Advent service in central London at King's Cross to wish everyone happy Christmas. No mention of uh, the docuseries or any reaction to it, but this is now the new story, where Netflix had asserted that they'd approached the uh, palace previously for comment, and that had not been forthcoming. Buckingham Palace now saying no such thing happened. Yes, Mark, it's very much for the royal family, keeping calm and carrying on. As you mentioned, the king has been out as this engagement this morning and, funnily enough, has not mentioned this documentary series of Harry and Meghan. Now, at the start of episode one, just to recap, there was a disclaimer saying that the royal family, Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace, were approached for comment, but they declined to do so. Now, from my understanding, in the last hour or so, we uh, believe it's understood that Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace, or indeed any member of the royal family was not directly approached to comment by Netflix or the production team um, to do with this documentary of Harry and Meghan. So unfortunately, we're in a situation now where it's Netflix and Prince Harry's PR team against what uh, those with inside Buckingham Palace and the royal household are saying. Now, there wasn't any perhaps bombshell re revelations from the first three episodes, but a theme which ran throughout the first three episodes was very much focused on Prince Harry's relationship with the media. And he spoke within that about his own romantic relationships and how journalists, how photographers, how paparazzi have really affected those relationships. So let's hear what he said. Every relationship that I had within a matter of weeks or months was splattered all over the newspapers and that person's family harassed and their lives turned upside down. Nana, I'm joined with Nana Akua, the GB News presenter. Welcome to the Royal Reaction Room. Thank you, thank you. I'll let you get away with that. It's a queer. A queer, okay, a queer. No apologies, <laughs> apologies. That's all right. Um, all right. So this relationships of mm. Prince Harry being hounded by the press in, in Prince Harry's words and how that has been damaging to him and his relationships. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, look, he he would have known that. The person who gets into a relationship with him would have known that. I'm surprised that he's talking about that as though that's some sort of great revelation. You know that if you get involved with somebody who is royal or who has some sort of um, big sort of standing on the world stage, obviously they are going to be hounded in a sense. I'm just confused as to why he thinks that that's a big revelation. It's just quite obvious. When Harry and Meghan's relationship became mm -hmm. public, Prince Harry talks in this documentary about the fact from talking to members of his own family or people within Buckingham Palace, he alleges that they said to him that every girl who marries into the, mm -hmm. marries into the royal family gets the same kind of treatment from the press and it you know, essentially dies down eventually. Prince Harry's argument is there was a race element when it came to Meghan. What do you think? Well, I mean, to be honest, I think that the others got treated far worse. I mean, if you look at Fergie, they were ghastly to her, weren't they? They were horrible. They were awful to Diana. I've seen pictures of, uh, and films of where she's been hounded by the press, almost like an animal in a cage, and they're all literally cornering her. I've seen that. They're not doing that at all. And then, obviously, Camilla, she had a bit of a nightmare as well. I mean, people hated her. She was the most hated woman in Britain for some quite some time. Um, I, I, you know, when they talk about the race element, I think... From my point of view, there may have been some people being a little bit racist, but personally, I didn't really see it. Meghan would have known. But at the end of the day, there was also the very, very positive aspect of it as well. I was so happy that finally somebody of some other colour, some sort of mixed race, had entered into the royal household. And I would say that the majority of the people in this country felt that way. And I think it is a little disingenuous to make that assumption that the whole country felt that way. Because it almost felt to me as though he was saying that this country is racist, we treat so badly, yet she is from America. I used to live in America. If you want to know about racism, you go there. Yeah, it's interesting you say that, mm. actually, because a lot of people are making the argument that within this documentary series, from what we've seen so far, mm. it's as if there's been no positive coverage whatsoever of the royal couple, and yeah. it's all been negative, That's all been criticising Meghan or Harry. And, and it wasn't That's rubbish. true, was it? That's yeah. rubbish. They, they, they were, I, I remember the headlines, the look of love. I mean, I can see them together. I, I, you know, I was driving at the time when I heard that he, he was with someone with mixed race. I punched the air. I took my hands off the wheel. I was like, yes! Everybody, I think this country was overjoyed. It was exactly what I thought 
we now know that's not the case. But I thought that's exactly what the royal family needed to, you know, and let's be honest, this family, uh, you know, they are heads of state in Commonwealth countries where a lot of good has been done. And a lot of these countries are very proud to acknowledge their, their British side. I know there's the colonial past and all of that, but Britain were the first country to abolish the slave trade. And it's not as if it wasn't a trade that was perpetrated by just white people, it was Africans selling their people. So I think it's a bit disingenuous to try and make out that, you know, everyone was against them, the press was against them. It's total rubbish. Nana, for the moment, thank you very much. Well, Mark, I'm in the GB News Royal Reaction Room all afternoon. Please send us your thoughts at G, uh, gbviews at gbnews.uk uh, and we will react to them and all the analysis, of course, from the first three episodes of Harry and Meghan's Netflix documentary series. And maybe we'll get some popcorn to you as well. You've earned it for the moment. Thank you very much indeed, Cameron. Uh, yeah. Let's move on to uh, other matters now. NHS waiting lists hitting another record high, with A&E departments experiencing their worst performance on record. Well, while NHS figures show that last week an average of 13,358 beds per day uh, were occupied by people ready to be discharged, uh, with nurses strikes, of course, still to go ahead on the 15th and 20th of December, and ambulance workers striking then on the 21st of December. Let's speak now to uh, NHS GP Dr. Uh, David Lloyd, who's joining us. Uh, Dr. Lloyd, thanks again for joining us. Um, one has to add, though, I mean, there is a, a sort of slightly mixed picture in these uh, figures in that uh, both ambulance waiting times and some A&E times, the 12-hour wait times, are actually down. Well, I don't know whether I would like to wait 12 hours waiting for a bed in, in any A&E department. Uh, I was listening to the radio this morning, and, I, and it's more like 15 hours. I I had a, a text from a patient of mine this morning who I sent into hospital on Tuesday night uh, at 6 o'clock, and they eventually got to bed their bed at 5 a.m. that morning. So it is, it is pretty difficult in emergency departments at the moment. Uh, and if you go and visit them nowadays, they are, they are looking very, very, very busy indeed. Yeah, uh, I... we're, we're packed out with this Group B strep in general practice, Every paediatric emergency department is overflowing with sick kids. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting winter so far. Yeah, and, and I can understand, obviously, parents being uh, rather uh, overcautious, but for quite the right reason uh, on that. But a, a bit of a clue as to what might be happening with Chris Hobson, the chief strategy officer at the NHS, uh, saying that, you know, 13,000 medically uh, fit patients uh, ready to discharge, but they can't get them out. And clearly that's causing this. I mean, we used to call it bed blocking, but clearly this is a problem for hospitals across the country. Oh, it's an enormous problem. It always has because we have a, a a system which, you know, rewards doctors and nurses in one respect. We we were certainly re respected uh, by the media. People like us, but nobody talks about those care workers that are putting in huge quantities of work for absolute minimum wages, uh, and their job is to look after people at home after they've come out of hospital, or to stop them going into hospital in the first place. Mm. We need a properly financed, properly working care system so that we can uh, have a, a system that works all the way through. You, you get a blockage in the A&E department, as you, as you so rightly say, because there's a, a failure for patients to get pulled through the hospital and out the other side as quickly as possible. I must say, every discharge summary that I get from the hospitals is astonishing. I'm always amazed at the amount of work that they do in those two or three days that the patient is in the hospital. They've had three or four scans, a, a mm. procedure or two, lots of blood tests. So they are working their guts out in, in our local hospitals. But then the problem is we've got to find them a safe landing space when they come home. Yeah, our yeah. very elderly patients are very frail and need that social care. Yeah, the social care sector, of course, is, is the additional problem. Can I also put it to you, however, that a lot of people perhaps are presenting at A&E because they can't get to their doctors. They're being told that they can't get an appointment or there's a video appointment and so on, that, that perhaps the, the GP structure is also failing the, the uh, health service as well. I couldn't agree more. We, we, are, uh, we are very, very busy indeed. I, I should probably be seeing sore throats and sick people up until eight o'clock tonight or nine o'clock tonight, depending on when the queue finishes, we are working out. We are working our socks off as well, trying to cope. But yes, yeah. it is very difficult to get a routine appointment with your GP or even an emergency appointment with your GP because we're just 
were just there was enough of us. Yeah. It would be quite nice if we had we had a few more. And we had, as you say, we had a system that works as well. It's all linked together, isn't it? Mm. It's we're, we're dealing with a a service that has been underfinanced for many years. We're talking, we're dealing with nurses who are earning less than they did ten years ago, whereas the the private sector earning way more. Um, you're you're dealing with a a system that is has reached a crisis, and COVID was a a brief moment when you know we had a, a terrible time. But I'm afraid it. It opened up the wounds of the NHS that have been slit, sitting there for, for yeah. several years. Yeah, bursting at the seams, I think, is the phrase that the King's Trust used. But can I just ask you then, before uh, we, we leave you, to get back to work, of course, uh, what's the picture you're getting on, on this strep infection? I mean, are you getting more cases actually coming through or is it that perhaps uh, that the public have been rather over-alarmed? Well, like any epidemic, I think it's a bit, a bit of everything, really. I guess I've got a lot of very concerned mothers and fathers and carers that are ringing yeah. up about their children with symptoms yeah, yeah. that are obviously viral. Um, but the trouble is we've been told that this triple-demic is, is a problem. So if you get someone who's got a viral infection but has also got a sore throat, do you as a GP give them penicillin and reduce the stocks of penicillin that are, that are, are falling as well? Or do you just give penicillin to everybody? It's a big, big problem for us as a, a GP. But in amongst all those people with sore throats and tonsillitis are the children with scarlet fever who are getting the toxin problem. And some of them will end up in hospital and some will end up with pneumonia and drains in their chest. But it is, it is a, it's a, you know, it's a well-recognized phenomenon. We've mm. seen it before. We know what to do. But the, yes, there is, there's a lot of illness out there and a lot of very worried people. Dr. David Lloyd, we'll let you get back to work and, and uh, help all those people. Thank you very much for your time once again. Bye-bye. Sobering picture. Uh, well, let's uh, talk about another sobering picture on the weather with a major incident declared in Sheffield after uh, many homes, thousands of people left freezing without gas. Engineers have been struggling to restore, uh, restore the supply rather after a, a pipe had been damaged rather by a burst water main with well, the temperature locally dipping below zero overnight, let's get another update now with Jack Carson, our reporter at the scene. Uh, and Jack, you were describing the problems not just for the mains as well, but even people's uh, sort of cookers and things uh, being deluged with water. Yeah, that's exactly right, Mark. People reported on Saturday when this burst water main initially started that actually um, they'd had they'd had water gushing out of the gas part of their uh, cookers, where their water meters are, where their gas meters are, water gushing out, including gas fireplaces, water gushing out of them. Some people's living rooms kind of partly flooded because of this burst water main. Um, and people now left without gas and with those people that have had flooded also power as well. Uh, we've just had a press conference here with, uh, with Northern uh, Power Paragrid, Paragrid, Cadden, uh, who are the gas suppliers here, and Yorkshire Water. And two residents were here at that press conference and actually raised some serious concerns about their own health and their own health of their own relatives as well. One lady questioned Yorkshire Water why they hadn't actually specified to anyone what was actually in the water. And she uh, was complaining about problems that her and her son had had um, with, their, with their hands and, and their skin since uh, washing, uh, washing and taking a taking a shower and, and taking and, and drinking this water they hadn't really had an explanation from Yorkshire water what was in it another resident complaining about his 78 year old mother who's recovering from bowel cancer and having chemotherapy left without power for the last six days um, Cadden and Northern Power Grid were were praised by these residents because they uh, they along with the Red Cross have been delivering blankets and delivering other other, other supplies as well but uh, Yorkshire water saying that they didn't really in expect this pipe and didn't expect this pipe to burst because it hasn't burst for the last decade and so constant maintenance they didn't feel was necessary. They do have an operation centre here where people and locals can go and talk to them and right. raise, their, their, raise their queries um, but this situation is ongoing here. Well clearly people have, have got a lot of questions still to be answered and we, we uh, heard this major incident being declared. Does that mean that people are actually getting direct help with, with food and heating and, and shelter and so on or they're, they're having to make up uh, what they can on, on the spot? 
A lot of it is just is the community coming together with the people delivering blankets to their neighbours, checking on their neighbours. There's been a few food trucks here over the last couple of days delivering hot meals. A local pub was offering residents uh, free hot meals and, and, and drinks to keep them warm and a space to keep warm. Many people having to literally live in their living room because that's the only place where these temporary heaters that have been delivered to their homes uh, are. They, they, one old lady I spoke to said, you know, they're, they're lucky that they've got a traditional fireplace in their house, but she said their bedrooms, every every else in the house is freezing cold. Houses which usually would have a, an inside temperature of 18 to 20, maybe 25 degrees in this serious cold weather, looking around 10 to 15 degrees, which is an internal temperature, is leaving many people very cold at this time of this cold snap. Yeah, really serious situation, of course, with the temperatures due to drop further and snow on the way as well. Jack, we'll be back to you to get an update and see how people are faring there. Thanks very much indeed. Well, coming up, Matt Hancock announcing he's not going to be standing in the next general election. What does that mean for him? What does it mean for his constituents? We'll be there to find out what they've got to say. But uh, let's take a look at that weather. How cold is it going to get? I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At six, it's Deems & Co. Seven o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. So I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess I've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious. Much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 pm on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Now, an American woman who killed the motorcyclist Harry Dunn in a road accident to be sentenced with the hearing getting underway within the next hour at the Old Bailey. Anne Sekoulis, the wife of a CIA operative working in the UK, pleaded guilty back in October to causing the 19-year-old's death by careless driving. But on the advice of the US government, she's not returned to the UK to face justice, as Alice Porter now reports. On the 27th of August, 2019, Harry Dunn was riding his motorbike to meet his father. He never made it. The bike collided with a car and he was killed. The car was driven by an American, 
Anne Sekoulis, who had just left a US airbase where her husband worked for the CIA. She quickly flew home to the US, claiming diplomatic immunity. The result was a transatlantic row which strained relations between the UK and the US, with Harry Dunn's parents fighting for Anne Sekoulis to stand trial. They filed a civil lawsuit in Virginia, where Anne Sekoulis lived, in the hope of compelling her to return to England for a trial. She needs to just do the right thing and just come back and face what she's done, face us as a broken family, face our UK system. But when the Crown Prosecution Service announced that Mrs Sekoulis would be charged with causing death by dangerous driving, the US refused the extradition request. There was widespread condemnation. Last year, it was announced that Anne Sekoulis would face a virtual trial before a UK court. And in September, she finally appeared at Westminster Magistrates Court via a video link. Then in October, on a video link at the Old Bailey, she accepted the lesser charge of death by careless driving, which carries a lower sentence with a maximum of five years imprisonment. This was accepted by the CPS and the family of Harry Dunn. That promise that was made the night he was killed. It's done. I'm done. I, um, I'm just going to stand aside now and just let the courts do their thing. Um, it's been a long three years. The case has been unprecedented, but for Harry Dunn's family, today's sentence means their battle for justice is finally over. Well, let's get uh, the latest live at the Old Bailey with Alice now. And uh, Alice, of course, remember her evidence being given uh, by video link. Now we've got the situation where the judge's summing up is being given on video on cameras in the court. Yes, that's right. Much to the disappointment of Harry Dan's family, the judge presiding over this, Mrs Justice Chima Grubb, had urged Anne Sekoulis to come to the UK for sentencing, saying it would be a weighty evidence of genuine remorse. She has, is not going to be coming today, and that was very much on the advice of the US government. They told her not to come. And Harry Dunn's family have said they were absolutely horrified that the US government would, they said, interfere with criminal proceedings in the UK and I think it's important to stress here what an unusual I think this is I always thought that was the, the motorbikes from Harry Dunn's family because they uh, uh, will be coming here later in court today. But I think it's important to stress what an unprecedented situation this is. Never before have we had a case where uh, the defendant has not even been in, in, in the country, let alone the courtroom. And it's, of course, caused an enormous uh, diplomatic spat, really, between the US and the UK. I hope there will be some sense of resolution today. And we are expecting the judge to give some clarity on what some sort of sentence uh, she will get and how on earth that will be served. It will most likely be some sort of community service, uh, which she has said that she had, would cooperate with. And it hopefully will draw some sort of line in the sand for Harry Dunn's family to have the criminal proceedings finish today, which may, now means finally more than three years on from Harry Dunn's death, some sort of inquest can finally take place. Alice, thank you for that. We'll let you go and get your place in uh, inside the court there. Thank you for your time. And uh, we'll update, of course, people with uh, our cameras live in the court. Uh, let's bring you some breaking news we're getting from the United States with President Joe Biden confirming uh, that the WNBA star Brittany Griner has been released from a Russian penal colony, uh, colony rather, after a deal was done uh, with the White House and the Kremlin on a prisoner swap. Uh, Griner is now in US custody, says the White House, uh, and uh, she'd been imprisoned on drugs charges in Russia, uh, now being returned to the United States in exchange for an arms dealer, Victor Bout. Uh, Griner had been facing nine years in a Russian penal colony. Uh, we get more uh, reaction to that as it comes through. But now let's talk about Matt Hancock. After that stint in I'm a Celebrity, Get, uh, get Me Out of Here, uh, the former health secretary basically... Uh, being an MP, get me out of here, because he says uh, he will not stand as an MP in the next general election. Let's get more with our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, joining us from Newmarket in West Suffolk, which is Matt Hancock's constituency. Uh, and, Darren, of course, we've got the situation where he's technically no longer a member of the Conservative Party. He's lost the, the party whip. So uh, just wondering what his constituents and, of course, his, his own party, as was, there had made of the way that he's announced this on TikTok, of all things. 
Uh, yeah, indeed, that announcement's coming yesterday, and in many regards, I think, Mark, because he was going to be pushed out, really, of his constituency here in Newmarket. He faced a choice either continuing potentially to run as an independent MP in two years' time when the next general election is due to be held, or not being selected as the Conservative candidate, because we know here at the end of November his party constituency, or as it was before he went into the jungle, uh, decided that they did not have any confidence in Matt Hancock, uh, that he was not fit to be their MP, and so it was unlikely, even if he had the Conservative whip restored at Westminster, that he would be allowed to be the next Conservative candidate at the next general election here in Newmarket. And so I think he saw the writing on the wall, if you like, and decided uh, to jump rather than be pushed. Now, I think for lots of the constituents here today, frankly, they're not exactly crying into the cups of tea and coffee this lunchtime. They seem rather pleased to be getting rid of Matt Hancock. Many feel pretty aggrieved uh, that he went into the jungle, that he took £400,000, clearly couldn't carry out his jobs properly as a full-time MP in Parliament. So I don't think too many people are too upset that he's not going to stand. What does Matt Hancock himself do next, though? Well, you know what? There is life in politics after being an MP. Suggestions he could be a candidate to be Mayor of London. I think whatever he decides to do, uh, you will not have heard the last of him because he is someone who likes to be in the limelight. So Matt Hancock might not be the MP for Newmarket in a couple of years' time, but he'll certainly be in some form of public life, I suspect. Darren, in Newmarket, thanks for updating us there. And, uh, yes, we'll uh, see what emerges on a silver screen or elsewhere. Uh, coming up, uh, latest on the weather and, indeed, what it's uh, going to do for the week ahead. Snow on the way, we're now doing, being told. Let's get an, uh, an update, though, on the news headlines now with Rhiannon. Thank you, Mark. It's 1.35, your top stories from the GB newsroom. NHS England has announced its latest data with waiting lists for routine treatment hitting a record high and A&D performances at a record low. 7.2 million people were waiting to start routine treatment at the end of October and in the same period just 67% of patients were seen within four hours of being admitted to A&D. Meanwhile, the British Medical Association Scotland has announced that junior doctors will be balloted for strike action after pay negotiations failed. The government has defended its decision to open the first UK coal mine in 30 years, saying it still intends on phasing out coal. The levelling up secretary has given planning permission for the new colliery in Whitehaven in Cumbria. Former COP26 president Alex Sharma has labelled the decision a backward step for UK climate action. The Duke of Sussex has accused the royal family of a huge level of unconscious bias. In Harry and Meghan's new documentary series, the couple say they want to challenge misinformation surrounding their decision to stand down as senior royals. At the start of the documentary, viewers are told the royal family declined to comment on the content within the series. But it's understood neither Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace, nor any member of the royal family were approached for comment. In this family, sometimes, you know, you're part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And there is a huge level of unconscious bias. The thing with unconscious bias is it's actually no one's fault. But once it's been pointed out or identified within yourself, you then need to make it right. It's education, it's awareness. And it's a constant, it's, it's a constant working, work in progress for everybody, including me, you know? And the last surviving dam buster has died at the age of 101. George Leonard Johnny Johnson was one of the original members of the RAF 617 Squadron. They were famous for the dam buster's raid of 1943, tasked with attacking German dams during the Second World War. He died peacefully at his care home in Bristol on Wednesday, surrounded by his family. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Mark will be back in just a moment.
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. And welcome back to GB News Live. With temperatures dropping below freezing this week, minus 10, we're told, or even worse, uh, and uh, snow already hitting Scotland, schools being closed in Aberdeenshire. Well, more than 3 million low-income households struggling to heat their homes, we're being told by agencies. The UK Health and Security Agency issuing the cold weather alert to recommend that vulnerable people wear extra layers to protect themselves from the plummeting temperatures. So charities have been stepping up to help people struggling during the cold weather. Our reporter, Rosie Wright, is with a charity, Wrap Up London. Uh, and Rosie, of course, very important because the advice that we're being told is heat the body, not the room. That's the way to really uh, survive, if you like, in these conditions. Yeah, but still don't forget about the room. The latest advice from the UK Health Security Agency is try and get your main living room to about 18 degrees. The reality is for many individuals, many families who are struggling, of course, this is the first time we've gone through a winter since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We know that energy bills are going up. The cost of living is rising. Items like clothes, coats become more expensive. And families often looking at the thermostat feeling really guilty, saying, when do I put this on? Well, lots of charities are at hand. This is sort of the headquarters, I guess you could say. It's this storage unit that is full of sacks, just like this. This, and they are full of coats and clothes that have been sorted by volunteers. Already, 10,000 Londoners will have received a coat either from a food bank or maybe their local worship centre, religious venue, and Kate gone home with one of these to help people stay warm. Just in the last hour since I last spoke to you, Mark, some donations have arrived, and Esther is on hand here volunteering for the day. Two sacks have arrived. Should we have a yep. look at what's inside? Absolutely. Let's let's see what's in there. So tell me what you've been briefed to do, because we're the kind of first people looking at these. 
sleeves now. So when clothes come in, we don't really know what exactly is in these sacks. And it can contain things that aren't coats, so we, we put those into a different donation Hats panel. or socks exactly. or whatever we've seen. But when it comes to coats, we want to check that it's good quality, there aren't buttons missing. We can see this is, I mean, this is a high fashion item. That's is, not going to keep is. you that warm, is it? No, so quality is important. We want it to be something that keeps people warm. Um, donations that don't meet those criteria are still used, they go elsewhere. But we want to make sure that they fasten. It's important that you're going to be able to zip up your coat. So no broken zippers, no broken buttons. And um, we also check the pockets to see if there's anything exciting in there. We found a lot of face masks and biscuits today. Biscuits, it's that's not, horrible. Not and not that hygienic to find presumably maybe even a used uh, face mask. No. Not for these coats then get washed, the don't they? Gloves. So we've got this sort of hot orange one in here now. There we go. Ah, oh, for a, nice, a child, nice child, obviously. Coat. So we want to check the pockets. Nothing. Oh, oh. Oh no, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared about what we could we've actually find. We've got a oh, little... Oh, a little glove. A little pair of gloves. <laughs> Someone's been missing those. So um, presumably this might be a child that's just grown out of this one. Exactly, exactly. But that's a really nice quality coat. Zip works. And then we fold it and, and bag it up. And that will get sorted, of course, all the way around this warehouse. We've got different zones for different genders and ages. Yep, that's all done by gender, by size. So it all gets packed up in nice, neat sacks. So. And where will those little gloves go then? Well, they will be donated elsewhere, but they... <laughs> They're separated from the coats. They're absolutely tiny. I wonder if it says on the label what age this would be for. Three years. Three there years we go. Old. Well, we'll make sure it's in the right place. Esther, thank you very much. I'll get thank back you. up again. Um, but there is a, a huge team of people going through the donations just like that as they arrive, but also people coming to pick up those bags to take them elsewhere. We think about 5,000 different coats will be taken off by different charities, organisations, sort of, uh, they call themselves here the coat people. So if you run a food bank and you think we've got people that we know desperately need coats, they'll get in contact with them here and say, hi, coat people, we need let's say seven male seven female coats and maybe some child ones too can you provide them and they say yep sure come to this depot and pick them up yeah and, and just to uh, ask as well I mean other things like uh, hats and gloves and scarves and all those extra bits to, to keep people warm as well so yes, like that little pair of gloves that we just found. Yeah. So the majority of the, the items that they have here are, of course, the coats. The other items will be donated. And then I'm not quite sure what happens to, maybe I'll show you a little bit later, Mark, uh, what they call the treasure box, that when there's someone's <laughs> keys in there or a book or their oyster card that they've left, I don't know where they donate those to. Some people ring back frantically and say, I donated my coat, but I've left something really precious inside. So absolutely every single thing that is found is kept just in case someone calls up and says, please, please, yeah. please, that you know, no a piece of paper was really special to me, I'd like it back. Or if it's the front door key as well, yeah. Rosie, uh, thanks very much for updating yes. us there to wrap up London. Back to you a little later. And, of course, we'll update you on the weather situation as well. But now let's return to the Meghan and Harry Netflix docu-series uh, released this morning. The royals bracing themselves, of course, uh, on what would be revealed. But they've actually now gone on the attack over an assertion at the start of the series that they were approached and then declined to comment on the films. Well, Buckingham Palace and Kensington Palace now saying that neither they nor any member of the royal family had been approached by Netflix. Let's speak to our royal reporter, Cameron Walker, who's been watching uh, all those uh, first three series in the royal reaction room. And, uh, Cameron, there has been a royal reaction. We remember that phrase that uh, recollection, recollections may vary. Um, they've gone a bit further than that this time. Well, there has been a royal reaction. You're right, Mark. It's not a direct quote, but it is very much our understanding that no uh, member of the royal family or Buckingham Palace or Kensington Palace were asked to comment on this particular Netflix documentary series, despite what it said at the start of episode one, that they were approached to comment. A small detail, but nonetheless, it does show that there are definitely two sides to this story, and it's very much a game of he said, she said. She said. Uh, I'm joined once again by Royal Historian Rafe Hadel Mankiw in GB News's Royal Reaction Room. Rafe, let's talk about, uh, I just want to pick you up on a point that Prince Harry said where he was talking about other members of the royal family who are female and the treatment that they received from the press. And the argument that, in Harry's words, that the palace were making that they received the same kind of treatment that Meghan has got, and Meghan should essentially suck it up and it will eventually move on. Um, Harry saw this as a race issue. 
I actually wonder whether Harry saw it as a race issue or whether Megan saw it as a race issue and Megan used Harry as her mouthpiece. Because actually the palace is absolutely right. The treatment that was meted out to Diana we know for well about. Also we've had you know awful scandals with Fergie and toe sucking and, and all the rest of that. And we've seen the similar similar thing around with Kate and anybody who comes into the royal orbit romantically goes goes through this process. To my, to my mind it seems as if uh, Megan had no idea about the British tabloid press for some in, in, un, unimaginable reason. Why else would she react this way? Because this is a woman who's absolutely used to the media more than any of the other women who've come into raw life. This is a woman who's perfectly placed to understand how the media works. And I think she was expecting a fairy tale to continue with the press as well. Uh, it was overwhelmingly positive, but I think this is a lady who comes from California with her woke ideology and simply cannot take any criticism at all. And I think she saw these headlines. Harry probably would have ignored them, and I think she was so riled up by this, never having seen this before, and she is the one who's caused Harry to make a big fuss about it. Yeah, and if you look back to the time back in 2017 where their engagement was announced, it, that we were still in the fallout from Brexit and the anti, what, what they are describing in this Netflix documentary series as anti-immigration uh, bias in the United Kingdom. Well, our very own GB News presenter, Nigel Farage, has reacted to that particular argument from this documentary. So let's have a little less listen to what he said. Well, perhaps no great surprise that Harry and Meghan choose to use Brexit as one of the causes for the terrible racism that was put against them. Uh, they draw on extreme left-wing historians. They draw on fake news headlines from The Guardian and elsewhere. And what they're really saying is that 52% of Prince Harry's country of birth are bad, racist people. This is all about politics, ultimately, isn't it? This is all about short-term, make money out of dissing the royal family and the United Kingdom, and then long-term give a political platform from which Meghan can launch her career in the USA. I have to say, I think in their actions, their behaviour towards their family and everybody else, they are nothing short of despicable. Down to the written statement. A quote, for, a quote from Nigel Farage, left-wing historians talking about British colonialism and the royal family's uh, role in the slave trade. Um, that was a big theme, wasn't it, Rafe? What, what's your reaction to that? Yes, well, look, Britain has nothing to apologise for. Britain was the first country in the world to abolish the slave trade. Uh, Britain almost bankrupted itself in compensating to avoid uh, uh, getting rid of, the, of slavery. The amount of energy was put into the Royal Navy to enforce the abolition of the slave trade on the oceans. You know, slavery continued long after in America, but it continued into the 20th century in Africa, where it had been going on for centuries. The Islamic slave trade carried on full well. Britain has a very, very proud record on this and the royal family king george the third actually wrote an essay condemning slavery decades before the abolition of the slavery yeah. to try to suggest in any way i mean there is a huge agenda with this series we've seen the two great historians quoted here are afua hirsch who wants to see nelson's column removed from trafalgar square blaming him of white supremacy and also we've had david olasuga who believes that britain is systemically racist there's a clear left-wing agenda in all of this and to try and and tar brexit with it with the brush of, of, of racism to try and suggest that immigration is the reason that there was an, an antipathy towards Meghan. There was such huge support for Meghan. I remember seeing outside Windsor Castle, those huge crowds along the Long Walk. I myself thought this was a wonderful chance to reconnect with the Commonwealth. There was a great outpouring of support. That wonderful wedding that we saw in St. George's Chapel, the Black Choir was Prince Charles's favourite choir. It wasn't one of uh, Meghan's uh, ideas to bring that choir in there. The Queen was the first person to actually, in the first time in history, that you've had a non-engaged member, member of the royal family inviting someone to Christmas. All of these mm. things were, were things that the British did with open arms to welcome. And I think it's, it's a great stain on, on, on Britain to try to suggest anything otherwards. Yeah, I mean, Netflix and those historians who took part in this documentary clearly aren't here to defend themselves. But nonetheless, there is definitely different opinions going on here in GB News's Royal Reaction Room. Mark, we'll be talking to you a little bit later on, particularly about how American audiences and British audiences are actually perceiving this documentary. So stay tuned.
Cameron, thank you very much indeed for that. But let's get the views now of uh, Pandora Forsyth, journalist uh, who's also been uh, following this. Uh, Pandora, um, it's interesting, uh, we're looking at reaction across the world, Le Figaro in Paris saying, hollow, meaningless, no new revelations. But the story seems to have broken now, actually once it's been aired, with a senior palace source challenging this written statement on the first episode that members of the royal family declined to comment on the content, saying no one had be been approached to comment. Yeah, um, if tensions weren't frayed before, then they most certainly are now. Uh, this is just before Christmas. And, of course, it's just before a book, which I think we've forgotten about this morning with all this Netflix drama. Uh, but that's also going to add more fuel to fire with relations between them. Um, obviously, they work, as they said in, in the documentary, as a business, but they're also a family. Um, and the relations are going to be extremely strained now. Um, they're not only obviously going to be annoying their family members by doing this, which they have been doing for months, but they're going to be annoying staff now as well, because it reflects badly on staff if they said, oh, we went for comment, um, but they declined to comment. And now the staff are saying, well, actually, no, they didn't come for comment at all. It very much seems to be divided into two camps now more than ever. Yeah, and, and uh, we ought to say that we are, have approached Netflix ourselves for comment to see what they've got to say, because this is significant, because Harry and mm -hmm. Meghan are co-producers of this. And clearly there was yes. unease about the uh, various trailers that went out showing uh, crowd scenes and, and uh, press photographers and so on, taken from other events that had no connection to uh, the, the two of them. And now we've got this direct... Um, well, it, it's, it's, it's actually, uh, in terms of this um, comment from uh, Buckingham Palace, um, calling out Netflix that basically this is an untruth. Yeah, um, and they've stayed so silent uh, on this, very much not complaining. But I think this might be the final straw, and that's why they've had to they've had to say something. Whether they'll go into further detail um, is yet to be seen. We've got uh, three more episodes coming yeah. out in a week's time. So what is within that? I think again will be telling as to whether they'll be saying more. Uh, on the Netflix drama. But King Charles was out today. He got um, pushed for questions on this and he he just ignored, refused and, and, and carried on. But there's only so much, so much, you know, uh, that I'm sure that he can take and, and William can take before they, they are bound to say something on this. Yes, indeed. As you're saying, as he was at an event, uh, these are earlier pictures, of course, with Cyril Ramaphosa on that state visit, but uh, visiting uh, an event uh, with an Ethiopian Christian church, wishing everyone Merry Christmas at that Advent service, which uh, perhaps is carrying on and keeping calm. Uh, Pandora, thanks very much indeed for your response and joining us here on GB News. Thanks. More reaction, of course, as we get it. Now, let's talk football. Uh, and World Cup, that important quarterfinal between the three Lions and reigning champions France... Uh, and uh, we are being told Raheem Sterling is returning to Qatar, uh, having, of course, uh, had to uh, get back to uh, Oxshot and Surrey after his mansion had been burgled. Uh, so a bit more firepower, uh, perhaps, to take on the French. Let's go live to Doha. And Paul Hawkins is there for us as well, back in action. Um, Paul, just wondering, actually, will he be needed, given the fact that the team has performed so well already without him? Well, that's a great question, Mark, because we know that Gareth Southgate is very loyal to his players and Sterling is one of his sort of core players, if you will, that's been an ever present throughout his time as England manager. Does he go back to him or does he stick with the lineup from the previous game? One would have thought you'd stick with the lineup that beat Senegal 3 0. So that's a really good question. We're just also hearing some lines coming out of the England press conference, which is taking place right now at their Al Wakra training base. That's just south of Doha. We're north of Doha, by the way at the uh, FIFA International Broadcast Centre this afternoon. And uh, we're, Calvin Phillips, the midfielder, is uh, giving that press conference and actually on Raheem Sterling rejoining the squad. Uh, he said it's a massive lift. He's an amazing player. We're just happy that everything is OK and he can rejoin us and he can play a big part in the uh, next game. He was also asked what about the fact it's Raheem Sterling's 28th birthday today and he says, is it today? I didn't know. I'll make sure I can go out of my way to message him now. So a bit awkward that 
he didn't know it was Raheem Sterling's birthday today, but I'm sure they'll be having uh, a, a, f a few bits of cake maybe later today. Yeah, not too much cake, hopefully, ahead of, uh, of the match. But we wish him happy birthday uh, and thanks for updating. He's a very smart-looking broadcast centre. Uh, very impressive. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Uh, you're watching GB News Live. Don't go anywhere because we'll bring you the latest in that sentencing in the Harry Dunn case with our cameras live at the Old Bailey. Let's take a short break now. We are GB News and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. You're with GB News Live. I'm Mark Longhurst, and uh, it's two o'clock. Here's what's coming up this hour with a former US spy who killed the teenager Harry Dunn to be sentenced and uh, in what's described as an unprecedented case at the Old Bailey because the cameras will be live in the court shortly for that sentencing. We'll have it live for you. An orchestrated reality show or a heartfelt cry from the heart. Uh, more from the Sussex show, Harry and Meghan's documentary hitting the airwaves, but already a row with both Buckingham and Kensington Palace uh, saying they had not been approached for comment as asserted by Netflix. And as temperatures plummet, we're heading across the country, including to Sheffield, where thousands of uh, people are still without power uh, to heat or eat. And as ever, uh, let us know your views, particularly, of course, on the docu-series. Will you be watching it in full? What do you think about what's been said so far? Get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.uk. For that, the latest headlines with Rihanna. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon. It's coming up to two minutes past two, your top stories from the GB newsroom. 
The NHS England has announced its latest data with waiting lists for routine treatment hitting a record high and A&E performances at a record low. 7.2 million people were waiting to start routine treatment at the end of October and in the same period, just 67% of patients were seen within four hours of being admitted to A&D. Ambulance response times have improved on previous numbers but still sit more than 40 minutes behind the target time of 18 minutes. GP David Lloyd says the pandemic exposed long-term problems with the NHS. We're dealing with nurses who are earning less than they did 10 years ago, whereas the, the private sector earning way more. Um, you're, you're dealing with a, a system that is, has reached a crisis and COVID was a, a brief moment when, you know, we had a, a terrible time, but I'm afraid it, it opened up the wounds of the NHS that have been slit, sitting there for, for several years. The government has defended its decision to open the first UK coal mine in 30 years, saying it still intends on phasing out coal. The levelling up secretary has given planning permission for the new colliery in Whitehaven in Cumbria. Former COP26 president Alex Sharma has labelled the decision a backward step for UK climate action. But Michael Gove says it will create hundreds of jobs. The Duke of Sussex has accused the royal family of a huge level of unconscious bias. In Harry and Meghan's new documentary series, the couple say they want to challenge misinformation surrounding their decision to stand down as senior royals. At the start of the documentary, viewers are told the royal family declined to comment on the content within the series, but it's understood neither Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace, nor any member of the royal family were approached. A comment. Make more sense to hear our in this family, sometimes, you know, you're part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And there is a huge level of unconscious bias. The thing with unconscious bias is it's actually no one's fault. But once it's been pointed out or identified within yourself, you then need to make it right. It's education, it's awareness, and it's a constant it's, it's a constant working work in progress for everybody, including me, you know? The Home Secretary says protecting the UK's borders is the number one priority and has confirmed the military is set to replace striking border force workers. People hoping to travel over the Christmas period are being warned of cancellations and delays over the eight days of action from the 23rd of December to New Year's Eve. Rail workers, postal staff, nurses and paramedics are already planning to strike in the coming weeks. Swella Braverman says the contingency plans will aim to minimise disruption. Well, we have been preparing for the prospects of border force strikes for some time now. Uh, we've been analysing what the impact of a shortfall of uh, op operational personnel on our border will be. Uh, we've got plans in place that will involve, uh, to a degree, uh, bringing in some of our military colleagues to help us in a variety of roles. And we want to, I mean, ultimately, you know, I'm not willing to compromise on security at the border. That's the number one priority. The US and Russia have exchanged jailed US basketball player Brittany Griner for a notorious Russian arms dealer. Victor Bout has been held in an American prison for 12 years. Ms. Griner was arrested at a Moscow airport back in February for possessing cannabis oil. Last month, she was sent to a penal colony. Last July, the Biden administration proposed a prisoner exchange. President Joe Biden says Griner's safe and on a plane home from the United Arab Emirates. People all across the country have learned about Brittany's story, advocated for her release, stood with her through, throughout this terrible ordeal. And I know that support meant a lot to her family. I'm glad to be able to say that Brittany's in good spirits. She, uh, she's relieved to finally be heading home. And the fact remains that she's lost months of her life, experienced the needless trauma. And she deserves space, privacy, and time with her loved ones to recover and heal. And the Shadow Chancellor has told industry chiefs that Labour is back in business at a party conference. Rachel Reeves has unveiled plans to make the UK the high-growth startup hub of the world. In front of a few hundred business leaders in London's Canary Wharf, she spoke of Labour's plans for economic growth. Britain can achieve so much in innovation, in trade and in growth. We have the ability 
But we need government and business working together to make the most of that great potential, to spread opportunity far and wide right across the country, and to allow everyone with the talent, the effort and the ideas to see their vision through to reality. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. It's back to Mark with GB News Live. Rhiannon, thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, an American woman who killed the motorcyclist Harry Dunn in a road accident is uh, being sentenced this afternoon at the uh, Old Bailey. Anne Sekoulas, uh, the wife of a CIA operative working in the UK, pleading guilty back in October uh, to causing uh, the 19-year-old's death by careless driving. We're being told that she has now appeared by video link from Washington for that sentencing. Uh, of course, Harry Dunn killed when she drove a Volvo on the wrong side of the road outside a a military base, RF Crowton, in Northamptonshire in August 2019. Uh, she wore a grey top, we're being told, and cream-coloured jacket at the hearing in Court 1, uh, declining to attend court in person on the advice of the US government. Now, we've got the situation that the sentencing uh, will be taking place with cameras in the court. We'll have that shortly. But first, let's get the background with Alice Porter. On the 27th of August 2019, Harry Dunn was riding his motorbike to meet his father. He never made it. The bike collided with a car and he was killed. The car was driven by an American, Anne Sekoulis, who had just left a US airbase where her husband worked for the CIA. She quickly flew home to the US, claiming diplomatic immunity. The result was a transatlantic row which strained relations between the UK and the US, with Harry Dunn's parents fighting for Anne Sekoulis to stand trial. They filed a civil lawsuit in Virginia where Anne Sekoulis lived in the hope of compelling her to return to England for a trial. She needs to just do the right thing and just come back and face what she's done, face us as a broken family, face our UK system. But when the Crown Prosecution Service announced that Mrs Sekoulis would be charged with causing death by dangerous driving, the US refused the extradition request. There was widespread condemnation. Last year, it was announced that Anne Sekoulis would face a virtual trial before a UK court. And in September, she finally appeared at Westminster Magistrates Court via a video link. Then in October, on a video link at the Old Bailey, she accepted the lesser charge of death by careless driving, which carries a lower sentence with a maximum of five years imprisonment. This was accepted by the CPS and the family of Harry Dunn. That promise that was made and I, he was killed. He's done. I'm done. I, um, I'm just going to stand aside now and just let the courts do their thing. Um, it's been a long three years. The case has been unprecedented, but for Harry Dunn's family, today's sentence means their battle for justice is finally over. Well, we'll be uh, expecting that sentencing shortly. As you say, the cameras are in the court. When that happens, we'll bring it to you. But uh, let's update you now on a row that's broken out in the Commons with the Speaker, uh, Lindsay Hoyle, criticising the levelling up Secretary Michael Gove uh, over the announcement uh, about this new mine, uh, the Cumbrian mine, uh, being accused of breaking the ministerial code by not actually uh, lodging the details for MPs to uh, look at in the Commons. Uh, he's also facing criticism from environmentalists after approving the planning commission uh, for the mine at Whitehaven. It's claimed it will provide coking coal for steel production rather than power, but the environmental organisation Friends of the Earth arguing that decision will damage the fight against the climate crisis, as our national reporter Ellie Costello now reports. Well, others are appalled that this decision has been made. Environmental groups and green groups saying this only puts Cumbria backwards in terms of the UK's green agenda. Carol Wood is from the South Lakes Action on Climate Change, which has been one of the most vocal groups opposing this new mine. Bitterly disappointed. Uh, South Lakes Action on Climate Change worked really hard on this um, public inquiry and we were able to get a lot of support from a lot of people to you know to participate in the public inquiry we we're pleased it got to that stage but this is a completely backward step for UK climate action and in fact global action 
um, and also about at least 85% of this coal is going to be exported. It won't be used in this country. British steelmakers, and most of the British steelmakers, have not signed up to using it. Um, so it won't be used in this country. That's a complete fallacy to say it's carbon neutral. And also, at the end of the day, the, um, it has to be burned. And the burning of that coal isn't taken into account when they're saying it's carbon neutral. So it's, 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 a problem. it's a global problem. It's not just affecting us in the UK. The burning of that carbon is actually going to you know, affect the whole, the whole world. Well, the green light has been given for this controversial new coal mine in Whitehaven in Cumbria. It's the decision that's been debated here for the past two years and has already been pushed back three times. But last night we got that 419 page document and outlining the decision that this coal mine will go ahead. Now, the mine at Whitehaven won't produce coal for energy. It will produce coking coal for steel manufacturing in the UK and across the world. Now, it will mostly be exported. Around 85% of the coking coal will probably go to Europe. But the argument is that this will reduce the need for the UK to import coal from places like the US, from China and from Russia. Now, the mine has really divided opinion here. We are in the red wall. Many people voted Tory here for the first time. And speaking to people here, many of them say this is the first sign for them of levelling up in action, investment in the north of England. And earlier I spoke to Mark Jenkinson, who's the Conservative MP for Workington. Well, I mean, it was fantastic news to finally receive. Um, I welcome the planning inquiry because it allowed us to have that adult conversation around the ongoing need for coke and coal well past 2050. I was delighted to see those arguments recognised and made, in fact, by the planning inspector and accepted by the Secretary of State. But it's really, it's hugely symbolic for not just seats like Copeland where the mine is or mine in Workington or indeed, uh, you know, but just Cumbria, but to the rest of the, the red wall as we as we've now come to know it, it's just hugely symbolic. It says that the government will not stand in the way of foreign direct investment that will be fantastic for our local economy. Um, and I think it's just after all we've heard around uh, new wind about fracking. I think it was just uh, reassuring to 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 see this decision being made that you know that says the government won't stand in the way. Uh, away you go. Uh, and get on with it. Well, the Whitehaven Mining Company say that this new mine will be modern, safe, efficient and green. But this mine, despite being approved, is not the end of this story. Ministers are already bracing themselves for legal challenges which could come from green and environmental groups in the next few days. Ellie Costello updating us uh, from Whitehaven on that story. We're well, coming up here on GB News Live. A right royal row breaks out over Meghan and Harry's Netflix docuseries. Uh, we'll have the latest as the palaces say they were not approached to comment on that, as asserted by Netflix. Uh, the latest with our royal reporter uh, in the royal reception room. Before that, let's uh, see what the weather's up to as the temperatures plunge ever further down. Hello, I'm Alex Deacon and this is your latest weather update from the Met Office. It's cold out there and it's staying cold even into next week. For many, though, it's a sunny Thursday, a few wintry showers here and there. And wherever we've got any showers, it could be icy. We've got northerly winds. That's the reason it's turned cold and they're sticking around. Not particularly strong for most. The winds are quite light. But where those winds are coming into northern Scotland, we've got plenty more snow showers to come through the rest of the day. We we'll see a few wintry showers over southeast Scotland, northeast England this afternoon. Snow here mostly on the hills and a few scattered showers just grazing West Wales, Cornwall and northern parts of Northern Ireland. Again, with some snow mixed in over high ground. For the vast majority, it's just dry, sunny and cold. Three or four feels colder in the wind across the north. But actually temperatures in the southwest may get up to five or six. 
pretty quickly, though, this evening. The map turns blue. A frost returns once more. A few more of those wintry showers, so perhaps a covering of snow in places across parts of northeast England, again, mostly over hills. At lower levels, the snow showers continue in northern Scotland. And icy conditions further west as well, where we keep the showers going as temperatures drop down to minus three to minus five, even in towns and cities. Perhaps not quite as cold overnight. Of course, the east weather will be a bit more cloud round on Friday morning, but still potentially quite icy. The showers easing tomorrow, of course, eastern areas, but we'll see more for Northern Ireland, Northwest England, North Wales and Southwest England. So again, it could be icy here. I've met office yellow warnings in place for, again, the vast majority. It's dry, it's sunny and it's cold with highs of just two or three degrees Celsius. And again, on Friday evening, the frost comes back and Potentially things are, are very icy with a few more wintry showers coming in to parts of the west, south of Scotland, Northern Ireland, parts of North Wales and northwest England. We'll keep a few wintry showers going this weekend. So we'll keep the cold and frosty conditions. And increasingly, we could start to see some dense freezing fog patches too. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeds & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. And welcome back. Now, Buckingham Palace has directly challenged Meghan and Harry's new Netflix docuseries, which was released this morning. Netflix, who co-produced the films with the couple, asserted that the palace had declined to comment on the claims made in the programmes. But now a senior palace source has denied that either they nor any member of the royal family had actually been approached. Let's get the latest with our royal reporter, Cameron Walker, who's been watching the docuseries for us uh, in the GB News Royal Reaction Room. And uh, Cameron, it seems the real story has broken out after they've been aired. 
Well, exactly, Mark. It's probably not what the palace wanted to be doing this morning, reacting to this documentary. They haven't officially reacted. We haven't had a statement, um, as we understand it. But what we have had is some kind of indication that what Netflix put out at the start of the first episode, saying that Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace and members of the royal household were approached for comment and refused to comment is actually false, according to uh, sources with inside the royal households. They say no member of the royal family was approached to comment. Clearly, we now have a problem where there are two sides to this story and we're not sure which one is true, which causes a bit of a problem. But I'm joined by uh, former royal correspondent Michael Cole, who's with me in GB News's Royal Reaction Room. And um, Michael, we were talking a bit earlier. I wanted to get your thoughts on this. The way that Harry and Meghan and the royal family are perceived both here in Britain and in the United States are quite different. But I was in Boston last week with the Prince and Princess of Wales and they could not get enough of William and Catherine. They loved them. So this idea that uh, Britain is racist didn't seem to be flying with the people that I had certainly spoke to in the United States. What are your thoughts? Boston, very hard town, a tough town, half Irish. It was the cradle of the American Revolution. The first shots were fired uh, on Bunker Hill. Uh, it's not necessarily pro-British, Boston Tea Party and so on. I thought they did brilliantly. The Princess um, uh, of Wales chose a beautiful green dress. OK, green for the earth shot, but also green for Hibernia, Ireland. and. You know, if you and I went to Central Casting in Hollywood and said, give me two characters who look like a prince and a princess, they would come up with somebody who looked like Prince William and Catherine. They are brilliant at the job and they are the next generation after King Charles. And Americans are very open hearted. They're very open minded and they've always had a great affection. When they talked about the queen, it was as, as if it was their queen as much as it was our queen. And I think, in a way, many Americans will be resenting this continual sniping by the Sussexes from inside their hilltop fortress, training their 16-inch guns on Buckingham Palace. And what we've seen today, really, there's not very much that's going to worry Buckingham Palace or Kensington Palace in there. Um, as damp squibs go, this one was dripping with self-pity and self-justification. Mm. We don't know what's going to be in the next three episodes, but I think what is very reprehensible are these general blanket accusations of racism. Race, the big no-no, toxic issue in, in the world at large, and but it's made without who? Who said what? What did they say? What was the reaction? We don't know. It's just general. And if you make an allegation of racism, it's easy to make and it's very, very hard to refute. You can't prove a negative. Mm, well, speaking of um, Prince Harry and, and race, he actually spoke about the way women are treated who marry into the royal family by the media. And he actually mentioned race when it came to Meghan's treatments by the media. So let's take a look at what he said. The direction for the palace was, don't say anything. No comment. Everyone just say no comment. But what people need to understand is, as far as a lot of the family were concerned, everything that she was being put through, they had been put through as well. So it was almost like a rite of passage. And some of the members of the family was like, right, but my wife had to go through that. So why should your girlfriend be treated any differently? Why should you get special treatment? Why should she be protected? And I said, the difference here is the race element. Well, I'm afraid we've uh, lost the link there to our raw reaction room, um, but uh, clearly Cameron was... Uh, talking to Michael Cole about the reaction in the United States. But let's just reflect uh, once more on what we learn from Buckingham Palace, uh, where we are being told a senior palace source has actually challenged uh, what was said at the beginning of that Netflix series, that uh, there had been no comment uh, when they'd been asked uh, 
on the various claims made in the series. Uh, Buckingham Palace saying that neither they nor Kensington Palace nor any member of the royal family had been approached by Netflix uh, and that uh, they would be not uh, having any kind of reaction from the king or other members of the royal household either. Uh, the king has been in King's Cross this morning at an event with the Ethiopian Christian uh, Church Advent service there, wishing everyone uh, a Merry Christmas. I think we can hear from Cameron once more. Cameron, we had a, a problem with the link to uh, the uh, viewing room there. We can hear you now again, I think. Yes, Mark, apologies there. I'm not sure how much you heard, but I was just speaking to former royal correspondent Michael Cole um, about the way that Prince Harry claims that people within the royal household were saying to him that every female member of the royal family basically gets the same treatment from the media and, and Meghan should therefore suck it up. And I was just asking Michael here, um, was it, do you feel Meghan should have got special treatment? She was, she could not have had a better and more open-hearted arms wide welcome into the royal family. Look at how the Queen accepted them, had them in, asked her to uh, Sandringham for Christmas. That doesn't usually happen when there's not an engagement already announced. In this country, if you look back at what happened at the time, and I remember it vividly, there had never been such a warm welcome throughout the press. It was universally that she was very welcome, the phrase, a breath of fresh air. And I recall those crowds in w Windsor Park, Great Park, either side of the Long Walk, 12 deep. They could not have, they were rock stars and they were very, yeah. very welcome. The problem is with this terrible allegation of racism, and it's been made in a non-specific way. We don't know who was racist, what they said and when they said it. Um, it, it's very, very hard to refute uh, because it's hard to prove a negative. But look, look at me, Cameron. When I was at school, that's how long ago it was, Her Majesty the Queen in 1960 was dancing a dance called the High Life with a man called Kwame Nkrumah. And Kwame Nkrumah was the autocratic dictator of Ghana. And the Queen throughout her whole life, because she really believed in the value and the veracity of the Commonwealth. She did everything yeah. she could to smooth and improve and foster good relations within all the races and nationalities and religions and colors and creeds of, 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 the, of, of, the, of the Commonwealth. Michael, we'll try not to take this personally, but Prince Harry <laughs> referred uh, to royal correspondence <laughs> in this Netflix documentary where he said we're essentially uh, a mouthpiece a bit, uh, for the palace PR machine, and he talks about his understanding, at least, of the royal rotor system. For those of you who don't know, just explain very briefly what, what that's about. Well, let me just say that neither you or I is an apologist uh, for the royal family, and, and I never was, and I'm sure you're not, uh, and neither are we their executioners. We are straightforward journalists from mainstream journalism who've been asked to do this job, and we do it to the best of our ability, honestly and straightforwardly. Uh, with regard to the Royal Rota, and I actually used to share an office with a lovely secretary called Lydia who ran it. The idea of the Royal Rota is if there is an event and everybody wants to go to it and it would be too many cameras, too many lenses there, they depute one cameraman, one stills man, one reporter to go and cover it and then the result is pooled. It's a good idea. It takes the pressure off the royal personality who's actually presiding on that day. So Harry completely misunderstands what the royal rota is. And you know something, um, there's a value in publicity. Her Majesty the Queen always recognized that. She said, I have to be seen to believe. That's why she wore those bright colors, not because she particularly liked them, but she knew she had to be seen and she wanted to be seen. And I can quote you a number of occasions yeah. when she more or less said that to me uh, and she prized that highly. She said 50% of my job is being seen. So if you're in the royal family and you're not ready for that, but you know, Meghan has lived her whole life wanting yes. to get publicity. And now she's got it. She absolutely does have it. Michael, we'll speak to you a little bit later on. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to me here. And GB News' Royal Reaction Room, Mark, back to you. Cameron, thanks very much indeed. And uh, apologies, of course, to everyone for the breakup in the signal there. But uh, we, we got back to the story, of course. Now, let's uh, reflect that the Arctic snap is hitting the UK with full force. Temperatures 
plunging well below freezing minus 10, we're being told. And the snow also on the way, uh, heading into the south, we're told, from next week onwards. The latest on how charities are stepping in to help those struggling to keep warm. First, let's get an update on the news with Rhiannon. Mark, thank you. It's 2.32, your top stories from the GB Newsroom. NHS England has announced its latest data with waiting lists for routine treatment hitting a record high and A&E performances at a record low. 7.2 million people were waiting to start routine treatment at the end of October and in the same period just 67% of patients were seen within four hours of being admitted to A&D. Meanwhile, the British Medical Association Scotland has announced that junior doctors will be balloted for strike action after pay negotiations failed. The government has defended its decision to open the UK, the first UK coal mine, for 30 years, saying it still intends on phasing out coal. The levelling up secretary has given planning permission for the new colliery in Whitehaven in Cumbria. Former COP26 president Alex Sharma has labelled the decision a backward step for UK climate action. The Duke of Sussex has accused the royal family of a huge level of unconscious bias. In Harry and Meghan's new documentary series, the couple say they want to challenge misinformation surrounding their decision to stand down as senior royals. At the start of the documentary, viewers are told the royal family declined to comment on the content within the series. But it's understood neither Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace, nor any member of the royal family were approached for comment. In this family, sometimes, you know, you're part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And there is a huge level of unconscious bias. The thing with unconscious bias is it's actually no one's fault. But once it's been pointed out or identified within yourself, you then need to make it right. It's education, it's awareness, and it's a constant it's, it's a constant working work in progress for everybody, including me, you know? And the last surviving dam buster has died at the age of 101. George Leonard Johnny Johnson was one of the original members of the RAF 617 Squadron. They were famous for the dam busters raid of 1943, tasked with attacking German dams during the Second World War. He died peacefully at his care home in Bristol on Wednesday, surrounded by his family. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At six, it's Deems & Co. Seven o'clock, Farage. At eight, join Mark Stein. And at nine, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by Headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News.
Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Welcome back. Now, as you may have noticed, temperatures dropping below freezing this week. Uh, minus 10, we're told, or even below uh, overnight. And uh, the snow also on the way. We're being warned uh, it could uh, uh, go as far south uh, as the south coast by next week. Well, more than 3 million low-income households now struggling to heat their homes, according to the various agencies, with the UK Health and Security Agency issuing their cold weather alert, recommending that vulnerable people wear extra layers to protect themselves as the temperatures drop. Charities are therefore stepping in to help people struggling. And uh, we can speak now to our news reporter, Rosie Wright, who's at Bow in East London with, um, well, piles of helpful bags. They're having to sort through, but there's plenty of useful stuff there, Rosie. Loads, Mark. Actually, 1,100 coats have been sorted through this afternoon by volunteers. And as you saw, if you were with us about an hour ago, an eclectic mix of coats in them. They all need to be checked that the basics work, like they can be zipped up, that they're actually warm and they've got real integrity, there's no tears, there's no rips. And then very occasionally, extra things end up in the pile. So all of these sacks are waiting for charities, other companies to turn up. It might be a food bank that says we need uh, extra coats. It might be a local church centre. These will all be collected. Collected, many of them by the end of the day. Sometimes extras turn up. John here is the man in charge. Uh, they call you guys the coat people. What happens when people donate things that aren't coats? Well, whilst we're principally coats, we get a lot of other things that could be warm or whatever that come in with those, and nothing ever gets to waste. Uh, we get all sorts of things from jackets to jumpers, scarves, hats and things. They all get sorted and cared for in exactly the same way as the coats do and are principally distributed to sort of through family centres, refugee centres and food banks. So just talk us through the process. If I'm at home looking in my wardrobe and I think actually I've got a coat that's in really good nick but I don't wear it, I could donate it. Talk me through the journey of that coat's life. Right, the journey of that coat's life is that you've got a pre-loved coat that for whatever reason you feel that, that you can donate. There are typically 40 donation centres right across the city during the month of November that you can drop off. There's bound to be one local to you. Often tube stations, train stations. Often tube stations in the first week of, of the month and then there will be fire stations, there will be libraries, there will be places like self-storage units that, that are opened up. Um, everybody's part of the family, everybody there knows what's going on and they'll give you a big thank you. We pick them up regularly every few days and then they come to a sorting centre just like we're at today where the story of today picks up and the volunteers sort them, they grade them, they check that everything works, they check their good quality and such like and then immediately go out to the charities. When the charities get them and local community groups um, they often arrange an open day around that um, because if somebody's coming in for a warm coat, there's a chance for a cup of tea and there's a chance about having a chat mm. for all the other things that might be happening in their life. Yeah. Um, I know that this week, strike action's been right at the forefront of the news agenda, but actually for charities like you, the train strikes, the tube strikes, that has an impact on the number of donations you get. Um, yes, normally our biggest period is the first week of the campaign where we have a really public launch and we collect at major tube rail stations um, and normally receive 1,500 or more coats a day. Um, that's something like 15,000, 17,000 over the first three days. Um, this year it was about 2,500 because people couldn't get into the city. Uh, lots of people commuting live outside of the city, so they've probably been unable to donate locally to themselves mm. at a local fire station or library. So It's another knock-on impact. Yeah. 
Show me through here. We go, go through if we can. And also the lights are obviously sensitive to movement, so it's getting dark in there. Earlier when we were going through one of the donation yeah. bags, there was a very sweet pair of gloves in one of the pockets. But also, of course, I, I mentioned I'd show you this to you, Mark. Sometimes people leave things in the pocket that perhaps they shouldn't have done. What's in your treasure box here? This is our treasure box. This is everything that, that we find um, in a coat pocket. We've got lovely little snowman. <laughs> uh, we, we've had sets of keys. Yeah, we've there's quite a few sets things. of keys yeah. in there and work passes. And work How often do you actually get a call where someone says, I mean, look at this, some Lego here. No one's going to ring and say, oh, my lovely Lego, can I have that right. back? Um, but we have had people, usually it's a couple of times a year, where people have left something that's of value. It might be the phone, it might be their car keys, but sometimes it's something quite simple. Mm. Um, and one of, just in a recent year, we had a lady phone up and said, had we found a photograph? And we'd found a photograph and it was very dog-eared and it had been folded up several times and stuff. Um, but it turned out that was the only photograph she had of her son that had passed away 20 years beforehand. So whilst to you and I, that might have looked as something of inconsequence, to her, it was a really yeah. valuable item. So we always keep a treasure box. We keep it for a good period of time because we never know that a small plastic ring out of a Christmas cracker might be in a grandmother's first present from a granddaughter and mean something to her. So, John, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. It's those simple things, but of course, the essence of this is it is really cold. Thanks to the team that work here and the people who donate the coats. Over the course of this winter, over 20,000 coats will have been donated. It's been a pleasure to be part of it and just spend some time with some of the volunteers. And hey, that might be a call now about someone else asking about where their coat is. Back to you, Mark. Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way.
That's GB News headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Kevin Brennan, your mum was a dinner lady, your dad was a steel worker, you ended up doing PPE at Oxford. That's quite a journey. How did you make it? Well, it was, it was quite strange, actually, because I wasn't predicted to do that brilliantly at school when I did my A-levels. I went to a Catholic comprehensive school in Wales. Um, and my dad actually got me a job in the summer down at the steelworks when the results came out. And it was my turn to go to the canteen and get some sandwiches. And uh, I phoned up the school and they, they, they said, you've got you know, three A's in your A-levels. And I was hoping for a B and two C's, I think, or something like that, to get into university. And uh, I said, yeah, that's right, three A-levels. I'm doing three A-levels. I said, no, no, you've got three grade A's. So this actually happened. I went back to the gang. We were working out on site in the steelworks. And they said, how did you get on? And they said, well, they said, I got three grade A's. And one of them said, you ought to go to Oxford. And that was the first time anybody had ever said that to me. And that's absolutely. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30 a.m. every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on... Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday night feast on... Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> there, 52 weeks of the year. So that is quite a, it's quite a significant... Um, state of affairs which has led us to say it's no longer just a problem it is now a crisis and that's why we have to take uh, drastic steps and we appreciate it's a drastic step to double somebody's council tax the next steps are now going to be for the government to legislate on the second home 100% council tax rise and it's due to come in place in April 2024. Anna Riley, GB News, Staithes. Well, our apologies for uh, some pretty major technical problems there. I don't know if you were able to hear me at all. Certainly, I think you could see me. Uh, so apologies for that as well. Uh, but let's now update ourselves by uh, 
looking forward to that important quarterfinal between the three Lions and reigning champions France. Uh, and someone we're told in contention now, Raheem Sterling. Yes, he's managed to return to Qatar, having left to uh, go back to uh, Oxshot in Surrey, of course, after the outbreaking uh, at his Surrey mansion. Uh, and uh, I think he's been able to train with the team as well. Let's get the latest from Doha. We can join our reporter, Paul Hawkins, uh, who's there for us. Uh, and Paul, uh, clearly, uh, the question is, will he actually get time on the pitch, given the performance of this last team? Yeah, that's a big question, isn't it? Is Gal Southgate going to stick with the team from the last game? In which case, no Sterling. Or is he going to go back to tried and tested, very experienced Raheem Sterling, who we know is one of his core players that's been there throughout his uh, tenure? What we did learn from Calvin Phillips, who uh, gave the England press conference this afternoon, is that he didn't know it was Raheem Sterling's 28th birthday today, which was a little bit awkward. Uh, but he has called his return to the squad a massive lift. And he said that the squad is just happy that everything is OK at Raheem Sterling's home and that he can rejoin the squad. Uh, uh, Calvin Phillips also confirming that Declan Rice is fit. He had missed a training session through illness, but he has trained now. He is fit and he is available for Saturday's big Le Crunch. Um, he was also asked this interesting question as well. Um, Philip, he was asked if he had to play, put on the bench or sell the three following players, who would he pick? So Erling Haaland, Jude Bellingham and Kylian Mbappe he said he'd start with Jude Bellingham. He said he loves Erling Haaland, who is, of course, his Manchester City teammate. Uh, but he reckons he would come off the bench and score a hat-trick anyway. And then he says he'd sell Mbappe because he'd probably get the most money. And finally, we also learned that Robbie Williams uh, was in the team hotel last night, sitting by the pool, playing a few songs. And uh, he, had a, he had a quick chat with him. Uh, and he said he was a really nice uh, guy and it was a really good night. Good night, uh, and that they have been uh, preparing for the match as well, enjoying themselves. Uh, uh, but clearly, it's an important part of a squad that they get time to relax together and, and they gel as a sort of group of players before hitting the pitch. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about, you know, togetherness and bonding, something that's not been a feature of previous England teams. You look at the so-called golden generation of 2006 that failed to win anything at that World Cup. Uh, there was uh, Rio Ferdinand's been very open about that. The, the, uh, you know, there were club factions within the squad. This squad is about sticking together and about bonding and having those shared experiences, even if perhaps you're not a Robbie Williams fan. It's going to be a huge game on Saturday. I was just looking up the England-France head-to-head statistics Statistics. Uh, they've played each other 31 times in the history, and England have actually won 17 of those we're, we're, uh, compared to France's nine. So you'd think that's, that's pretty good odds. When you actually drill into those statistics, when it comes to games that matter at the Euros and World Cups, England last beat France at the World Cup in 1982. So when it comes to big games like these, England, uh, you know, history is not on England's side when it's games that matter, and that's why togetherness, uh, you know, team spirit, those kind of things are really going to help lift England through the gears if they're going to have any sort of uh, chance against the world champions on Saturday. Yeah, and of course it's, it's psychology as well as what happens on the pitch. Uh, and we do remember that first half hour, that last match, that they were a little bit hesitant passing it across uh, the, the, the back to the goalkeeper and so on. They've really perhaps got to go on the attack from the, from the, the whistle going to, to get on top of the French. Yeah, the, the one thing when you speak to England fans here is the only thing consistent about England is inconsistency. Which England half is going to... If you look, if you split up each game that they've played, each of the four games, you get one half where England are, as you say, passing the ball sideways, backwards. They're tentative. They're taking a while to make the decision about what to do with the ball. They're not going for... They're not playing the ball forward and they're not doing it quickly and at speed. When you get the halves where England do that and they attack the opposition, they're a force to be reckoned with. So the big question is... Which England are going to turn up on Saturday and hopefully it's the one that really has a go at that French defence which has yet to be properly tested. We'll let you get out of the traffic because it's starting to look a little busy there. It might uh, be <laughs> a little perilous. Uh, but Paul in uh, Doha, thank you for updating us. Of course, all the latest as we head towards that very special game. Uh, just to alert you again on the weather problems, uh, minus 10 and below, snow on its way as well. Maybe that's what's affected our equipment. However, uh, apologies for all the technical glitches. Let's get an update on the weather with all the details now. Hello, I'm Alex Deacon, and this is your latest weather update from the Met Office. It's cold out there, and it's staying cold 
even into next week. For many, though, it's a sunny Thursday, a few wintry showers here and there. And wherever we've got any showers, it could be icy. We've got northerly winds. That's the reason it's turned cold and they're sticking around. Not particularly strong for most, the winds are quite light. But where those winds are coming into northern Scotland, we've got plenty more snow showers to come through the rest of the day. We we'll see a few wintry showers over southeast Scotland, northeast England this afternoon. Snow here mostly on the hills and a few scattered showers just grazing West Wales, Cornwall and northern parts of Northern Ireland, again with some snow mixed in over high ground. For the vast majority, it's just dry, sunny and cold. Three or four, it feels colder in the wind across the north, but actually temperatures in the southwest may get up to five or six. Pretty quickly, though, this evening, the map turns blue. A frost returns once more. A few more of those wintry showers, so perhaps a covering of snow in places across parts of northeast England, again, mostly over hills. At lower levels, the snow showers continue in northern Scotland. And icy conditions further west as well, where we keep the showers going as temperatures drop down to minus three to minus five, even in towns and cities. Perhaps not quite as cold overnight. Of course, the east weather will be a bit more cloud around on Friday morning, but still potentially quite icy. The shower's easing tomorrow, of course, eastern areas, but we'll see more for Northern Ireland, northwest England, north Wales and southwest England. So again, it could be icy here. I have Met Office yellow warnings in place for, again, the vast majority. It's dry, it's sunny and it's cold with highs of just two or three degrees Celsius. And again, on Friday evening, the frost comes back and potentially things are, are very icy with a few more wintry showers coming in to parts of the west, southwest Scotland, Northern Ireland parts of North Wales and North West England. We'll keep a few wintry showers going this weekend. So we'll keep the cold and frosty conditions. And increasingly, we could start to see some dense freezing fog patches too. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV 